Hello there and welcome. In this new series, we're going to learn Unity and we're also going to learn C Sharp, which is the coding language used in Unity. So this series is meant for absolute beginners. If you don't have any prior knowledge in coding or in Unity, you will fit right in because we're going to start from the very basics and go up. If you do have some coding experience, you may feel like this series is too slow and you may get bored, but maybe you will learn something new so you can check it out and see if it's for you. But it will be very slow paced. We're going to cover all the basic elements in coding in C Sharp and in Unity itself. And we're going to build a small game, a very simple game. But the point will be to actually learn coding, at least at a very basic level, and learn Unity. Later on, you will be able to actually go to other tutorials that teach you the specific game you want to build. For example, a 3D survival game or a top-down open world RPG, whatever you want. But you can't really start building games like that without the fundamental knowledge. So I see all kinds of tutorials that teach you how to build a 3D game or something specific and people just start these tutorials and they follow the instructor, they copy all the code and eventually they're just left with this copy of a game and they don't really know what they did inside, right? So when they need to change something or do something that they want to be unique, they don't know how to deal with the code because they don't understand it. They just copied everything the instructor told them. So that's not the point. The point is to actually understand the code and to be able to change it and build your own code. So if you don't know anything about coding, you don't know C Sharp, you don't know Unity, this is the place to start. So if you don't have Unity already installed on your PC, we're going to download it. So we search for Unity and we are going here to the official website, get started. And don't be afraid of these numbers because this is for big studios and all kinds of big corporations. But we're going here to the individual tab and we have two options, student or personal. The student has more benefits, but you need to uh, verify you need to actually prove that you're a student so if you don't want to mess with all of that you can just use the personal one and it's very good you can still do a lot of things with it you can actually build games as long as you don't make more than a hundred thousand dollars in a year it's good for you so i think most of us can use it so we click here on get started and start here and then we agree to all of these things and it will download Unity Hub. So Unity Hub is the software that is used to actually download the editor itself. So after we downloaded Unity Hub, we're going to open it and we're going to see this panel here. You are not going to see any projects because it will be empty. So all you need to do is click here on new and create a new project. If you're not seeing this option, if there is nothing here, you need to go to installs and here you need to add a new version of the editor. So you click add and you will see all kinds of versions. Usually it's best to use the recommended one unless you really want something specific. So you click the recommended one next and it will download the editor. Then when you have the editor installed, you can go to projects and actually add a new project. So we're going to create a new project just click here you select the version and here you have all kinds of options we are going to start with a 2d project because 3d is a little bit more advanced you need to know more stuff and we really just want to learn coding we really want to learn the very basic things of unity we don't need a 3d right now okay so we are going to start with 2d and this is the location where the project will be saved. So you need to select your own location. And here we are going to give it a name. I'm going to call it 
to the tutorial okay and create so now unity will start creating the project it will take a few moments okay so when the project is ready you're going to see the unity editor itself it will look a bit different in your case because i played around with the panels i moved them and also your editor will probably be white uh, the way you get this darker look is you go here to edit you go to preferences and in general you go to editor theme and you select dark okay and then you are going to get this dark editor so there's a lot of different panels a lot of different buttons but we're not going to go over each and every one of them because that's pointless right we're going to learn what everything does when we're actually going to use it some of these things i never use them so we don't need to know that we don't need this extra knowledge so as i said the panels will be a bit different in your case but you need to know that everything can be changed for example the hierarchy it's hard to say hierarchy is over here i think in your case it's somewhere here okay so you can just click on it and drag it and change its location eventually you're going to find the exact location which is comfortable for you which is easier for you for your eyes this is the way i like it so i have the hierarchy on the left side this is where we see all of the things all of the objects inside our scene okay so the scene is like the area where we actually build the game and here we can see all of the items inside our scene so we have the scene here we have the name of the scene and we have the item for now we only have this main camera okay and this is the hierarchy panel this one here in the middle it's the scene panel so again it's empty because we don't have anything inside we only have the camera so we can see this camera icon okay we can do all kinds of things here but we're going to learn them as we go again you are not going to see this animator because it will be hidden so we're going to use that when we're going to learn about animations right now just forget about it let's just close it okay and here we have the project panel so here you're going to see all the folders that are related to this project so just keep in mind the folders that you have in one project are not visible in the other project so here we're going to create for example a folder called scripts and now if you create a new project you won't see it because all of these folders here are individually created for each project okay so we have this main folder that is called assets and inside we have two folders one is called scenes and one is called scripts okay and inside the scenes we can see this sample scene which is this scene that is open right now that we are working on later on we're going to have more scenes but this is the default scene okay and in scripts we have nothing because we didn't create any scripts and later on we're going to create even more folders okay and packages you can just ignore it right now basically it's all the things you download for example all, all kinds of assets all kinds of uh, things you can use in your project but for now we are not interested in that so the next thing we have this game panel so that's one of the more important panels we can again make it bigger smaller we can change its location again whatever suits you whatever feels right for you and this is the place we're actually seeing the game when we want to test it for example i change things here in the scene i move things around and i want to see how it works how it actually works in the game so i go here and you see this play button i click on the play button and it will run the game in this screen so right now it's empty because we don't have anything in our scene but later on we're going to see everything inside and you can also click maximize on play so whenever we click on the play button it actually runs the game on the entire screen so it's easier to see with the resolution 
You can also change the resolutions, you can play with all of this, but right now let's just leave it as it is. So I like to put the game here because anyway, I like to test it while it's maximized, so I don't need this panel. Also these panels, animation, tile palette, you don't need it right now, you won't even see it right now. So again, let's just get rid of it. Close tab. We can always open these tabs, we can go here to window and we can find all these windows here. You can see we have hierarchy, inspector, project, scene, we have animation, animator, so we have all of these things here. And the last one is the inspector panel. Actually the inspector and the navigation, but forget about navigation. So the inspector is the place we actually mess around with our objects, but right now we don't have any objects. If we click on the main camera, we can see that all of these settings appear here and we can actually change the transform. We can change all kinds of settings here. So each object in our scene will have different settings that we can play with. Okay. So I'm not going to go into these details because as I told you, we're going to learn about them when we actually use them. The only thing I want to show you is this transform part. So each object will have a transform and a transform is the component that deals with the positioning of the object. So we can change the position, we can change the rotation and we can change the scale. And each one has three values. It has the X, it has the Y and it has the Z value. Okay. So if you remember from school, from geometry, we have the X axis, which is this axis. Okay. It's from left to right. And we have the white axis, which is up and down, right? And Z axis is something that we're not using in a 2d project. But if we are going to use a 3D project, we're going to use Z because Z is the depth of the scene, right? But in a 2D game, we don't have depth, so we're not using Z. We have all kinds of uses. For example, if we want to put something in front of, it, of another thing or things like that. But in a 2D project, we're not using the Z value, okay? We're only using the X value and the Y value. Okay, so that's all for the first episode. In the next episode, we're finally going to start bringing stuff into our scene. We're going to start learning what we can do with everything. And we're also going to start coding and learn the basic elements of coding. So please subscribe so you can actually follow this tutorial and not miss any episode. I'm going to also start a 3D survival game tutorial. It will be more advanced, but after you learn the basics, you can actually join it and you can maybe learn something new and you can watch any other videos that come out. So it's a good thing to subscribe. Uh, so thank you for watching and see you next time. Hello there and welcome. In the previous episode, we installed Unity and we also learned a little bit about the editor, we saw the different panels. So it was really a brief introduction to Unity. Today we're going to actually start adding things into our scene. So if we look here at the hierarchy panel, we can see that we have this main camera, which is our only object in the scene right now, right? And on the right side in the inspector panel, we can see that we have these different components. We have this transform. Okay. We have this camera component. So each object will have different components, but the transform component will actually be on every game object. And then we're going to have different components depending on the game objects, because this is a camera. It has the camera component but other game objects will have different components and we can add the different components. But the transform component will be present on all of the game objects because this is the way we actually control the positioning and the rotation and the scale, which is the size, right? 
So we're going to right click here and we can see this list here of items. So all of these things are, these are objects that we can add into our hierarchy. We have UI elements, we have effects, we have 3D objects, and we have 2D objects. But because this is a 2D project, we're going to use 2D objects, okay? And we have this thing here, which is the empty object. So we're going to click on this, create an empty object, and we have an empty object right now. So if we click on it, we can see that we only have the transform component. We don't have any other component because this is an empty object, okay? And if we look here, we can see that we have something to move. We can move it on the X axis. We can see that the X position moves. We can move it on the Y axis. We can also click here on the square and drag it all over the place and we'll change the position, but there's nothing here. We can't really see it, even if we zoom in. Okay, so can, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in or zoom out, okay? But there's nothing here. There's nothing here. There is something here. It's this game object, but we don't see anything visually because there's no component, right? We need some kind of visual component to actually see the game object. So we want to create a first element inside our scene, which will be visual, and it will be the player. So in order to do that, we need to add a component that will be a sprite, okay? And to do that, we need to add a sprite into our project. And a sprite is basically images that are converted into Unity. So in the description below the video, I provided a link to a website. It's this website. It's a very cool and useful website. It's called Character Generator. You can actually create your own top-down pixel art character. You have so many options. You have different clothing. You have weapons. You have, it's really a gold mine when I discovered it because people usually focus on the character and Let's be honest, most of us, we are not artists and I'm not an artist. So we only have an option or to buy assets. So we need to spend money, but we don't want to spend money because we're just building projects for our own sake, right? To learn, to, to learn how Unity works. We don't really want to spend money because we don't know if we are going to get money back. It's not like we're building games that we're going to sell right now. We're just starting. So people get stuck on this because they can't find a normal player or something to use in their projects. So this website here, you can actually create your own sprite of a player and you're going to get this entire sheet of sprites. And then I'm going to show you how you can use it inside the project. So I'm not really sure about the legal use. I don't know if you can actually use it and then sell your game and there will be a problem or not, but you can definitely use it in your own project. If you want to read more about it, you can go here, maybe into credits and then figure out if you can actually use it or what are the rules that you need to follow here to use it. So all you need to do is we have this sheet here that we can see all kinds of positions of the character, of the player, and we can change it. So we have male and female, we can change it to female or male. Let's use a male. Then body, we have different things. We have human, we have all kinds of creatures. We have wolf, man, special, zombies, so many things. But we're just going to use this standard male right now. And again, you can play with this. You can create whatever you want, we have different wounds. You can change the eye color. You can change all kinds of masks and play with the clothing. So let's just create something very simple to use in our game. Okay, so I created this very simple character. We have some brown shoes, black pants, and a red shirt. Also very simple 
haircut. So when you think you're ready and you, you again, you can use all kinds of accessories and things, but we are not going to spend too much time here. So when everything is ready and you think that you have all the items that you need, you're going here and you click on save result as PNG. And then it will download this file. So if we go inside, you can see that we got this entire character sheet. All we need to do right now is we have two options. We can go here and we can bring this character sheet into our project from within our project, or we can just go to the location we downloaded and just drag it into our project. But first let's create another folder. So let's click on create folder. Let's call it art. And we can go here, click inside the art folder and we can right click and import new asset. And then we need to go and search for the file that we downloaded. Okay. But we can simply go to the location, take the file and just drag it into our folder. Okay. And now we can see that we have this file here, but right now we still can't use it. We need to import it as a sprite. You can see here, texture type sprite. So in order to import it into our game, it is inside the folders, but it's not recognizable by Unity. So here we have different options for the import of this file. And because we know that this file will be of a character and it will have multiple images inside, we're going to go here and we're going to select multiple because we're going to have multiple images made out of this one big file. Okay. And then we have the pixels per unit. Right now we're just going to focus on 16. Okay. Because we want 16 to be our guiding size. Okay. We're going to make the tiles 16 pixels. We're going to make the character 16 pixels. So we're going to just leave it at 16 right now. And we're going to leave mesh type as it is. And we're going to leave that as it is. Again, I told you, I'm going to explain things that we're going to actually use, but if I'm not explaining, it means that we're just leaving it as it is. And here we're going to change it from bilinear to point, no filter. So this is just the type of conversion. Okay. And I think this one is better because it will make the sprite look a little bit sharper. But again, you can always play with these settings and maybe something will look better for you. Okay. And here we can actually change the type of compression. So for example, we have a huge file that weighs a few megabytes and a few megabytes, it seems not much, but if you have thousands of files, eventually your game will be very big, very heavy. So that's why we have this option to compress it when we import it. So we can compress it on high quality. We can compress it on low quality and we can compress it on none. So none, it means we're not going to compress it. And if this file weights like one megabyte, it will stay at one megabyte. So if you don't want to lose any quality of the file and you don't care about the size or the size of the file is very small. So again, you don't care about the size. You can just leave it at none, especially if it's a small game. If you're going to create a huge game, then yes, you probably should uh, use the compression. Okay. Otherwise your project will be huge. So we're going to leave it at none. We're going to leave everything here as it is. And we're going to click on apply. And when we applied, we can go into the sprite editor. So right now we still can't use it because it's just one big file. We want to take the characters one by one, right? We want to cut them, we want to slice them. So we are going here into the sprite editor. Again, of course we select the image and here we're going to see all of the characters positions. Okay. So right now we need to slice this image into small pieces so we can actually use each and every one of them. So if you're asking, why do I need all of these characters? If we just need one player, right? I can just take one image and use it. But what about animations? 
So we have so many different positions that look almost identical, but a little bit you can see here, the character is actually walking. So all of these images here are used to create an animation for the player to move. So when he walks to the left and here when he walks up and here when he walks down. So we're going to deal with that when we reach that part of making an animation for the player. But right now we only want one image of the player. So again, we can start with slicing everything up right now or we can just slice one image and use it but i recommend slicing it up right now because if you're going to for example select one character and just select it you can see here we have the width and the height of the character and then you're going to click apply we only have this character right now this one image and if we click on it we can click on this little arrow and we see that we have this one character and it's fine and we can use it we can drag it into our scene we can drag it into the hierarchy but the pixels may be different the cutting may be different and then when we try to make an animation it will look weird so it's better just to cut it from the beginning if we already know that we're going to use all of them so we just are going to delete that and we're going to go here to slice click on slice and we have different options to slice this one big file we can click on automatic let's see what happens slice it will cut all of them and you can see that there is a square all over these characters but that's not good because for example, you can see that this one here is smaller than this one. So when we're going to create an animation, it will move a little bit to the side. And we don't want the character to move to the side. We want him to stand in one place and just move his arms. So it's not a good way to cut these. If we had like a rock or a stick, then yes, we could just cut it all around it. But for a character, we want all of the squares to be the exact same size, right? So we're going to revert here, revert it. It's like cancel it. Let's also cancel this one. So let's go to slice. And the best way to use, we can also use grid by cell size. So here we actually specify the pixel size. And we can also use grid by cell count. So we have the columns and the rows. So we have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10, 11, 12, 13. So we have 13, right? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, 21 by 13. So we can just go here. And we can say column 13 row 21 slice and now you can see it sliced everything perfectly so now each square is the same size as the other and the character is exactly in the middle and that's the best way to work especially with characters that you want to create an animation out of later on so if we click on each one of them you can see that it's 64 on 64, 64 on 64. And that's the way this file was made. So this file was made so they will be actually standing in these positions and it will be easier to cut it. So now that we have this cut the way we want, we are simply going to click on apply. If we have like a huge file with hundreds of uh, objects it can take a while when we click on apply but we didn't have a lot of items so it was pretty fast so now when we applied it we are simply going to click on X and now we have this file ready so if we click on this little arrow we can see that everything is separated if we move this here we can see that we have all of these versions of our player 
separated. So we can choose this one, 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 and it's nice. And we can see that if we drag something into the scene, it appears in the hierarchy. Because as I told you, the hierarchy shows all the objects that we have in our scene. So let's just delete all of them. And let's just pick someone that will be like our default image right now. Before we start with the animation, just so we have a visual representation of our player. So let's choose this one. Okay. And let's just drag it in. Okay, now we can close this, we don't need it anymore, and we have our player. We can go back, so we can also see it in our game window, in our game panel, right? And we're going to change the name of it because download 0, 2, it's not something very... You always need to give it good names, so if you have a lot of items in your scene, you are not going to just go one by one to check what it is. So it's good to have a good name. So let's call it player sprite, okay? And if we click on the sprite right now on this object, we can see that we have the transform, of course, but we also have another component, which is the sprite render. And this is a component that deals with all the sprites right? So we have the sprite here, and this is this sprite. So for example, we have this one, and then we did something with it, and we want to change it, we can just go here to the sprite render, and we don't need to delete this one and bring a new one inside. We can just take this one, and go here to the sprite, and select a different one, and it will change it, right? Because here we say, what is the sprite? So let's select the one that we had earlier, this one, okay? And here we have all kinds of different options and settings, but again, we're not going to touch them right now, okay? But this is the sprite render component. And we have our character and that's good. So right now we can see that we also see him in the game panel. And if we click on the play button, uh, let's maximize it. We can see it here. But again, there's nothing we can actually do in our game. We can't move it. We can't interact with it. We can't do nothing. The problem right now is that I think that the character is a little bit too big. So let's just go here into the camera, into the main camera. And we can see here we have an option to change the size of the camera. So the size will be the distance of the camera from the scene. So if we're going to change it to 10 instead of five, we can see that the camera became bigger and it means that the character, our player, became smaller. The player didn't really became smaller because the size is still one. That's the default size, it's still one. But the camera became bigger. So now in the scene, the player looks smaller. And I think that's a good size. Maybe we're going to change that later. But you can see that you can change the size of the camera and it will affect the way we see the items inside our scene. And if you're wondering how can I change this blue screen behind it, it's just the default way we see the scene because we you can see here that it's empty. We have nothing here. We don't have any grass or some floor. That's just the empty background. So it's blue, but we can change it. We can just click here on this background and change it to white or to black or to this gray. Okay, so we're not confused. Okay, and we can leave it like this gray, whatever you want. And we have different options, as I told you with the camera, but we're not going to deal with that right now. Now we have this sprite, the player sprite, but the right way to work is actually place it inside this game object and rename this game object, call it player, okay? So now we have this player. Again, 
you can do it in any way you want. You can take the player, empty object, and you can place and drag this sprite inside. And now you can see that this sprite is a child of this empty object. You can do it with all of the items, with all of the objects inside our scene. You can also take the camera, drag it inside, and it will be a child of the player. So you can see we have this little arrow, we can click on it and it closes it. It's not, uh, we're not deleting it or something, it just hides it, but it's all inside this player object. And we can click on it and it shows all the children inside. So this is the parent object and these are the children, okay? It's called children because they're inside the parent. And this is a good way because sometimes we want to control the parent. For example, we want to control uh, the player. And if we're going to move the player, we want all of these things inside, all the children to move as well, right? So that's why, for example, we have the camera. And in some cases, you want the camera just to stand still and for the player to walk around inside the camera, right? But sometimes you want the camera to actually move with the player. So you can put the camera inside the player and then when the player moves, the camera will move with him. And you can also create a script, which we didn't talk about, but scripts is the actual coding in Unity. So we can create a script that tells the camera to follow the player. So we can leave the camera outside and say, okay, follow the player. And it will be the same as just placing the camera inside of the player, okay? And it will move where the players move because it's inside of it, right? So we need to understand that there's a way we can actually play with it and there's all kinds of uses for that. So we have this player empty object and again we have no components and we can store inside this player. Because think about it, for example, if our t-shirt and our pants were separate sprites, right? We had a separate sprite for our clothing and we wanted to place them on our player. So we could just place these sprites inside the player. We could uh, move them around and set them on the exact position. And then it was all a part of the player. And then if we move the player, these things would move with him, for example, let me give you a demonstration. If I'm going to take another image here and I'm going to put it in our scene, now it's not a part of the player. So if I'm going to move this one, it will move by itself. And if I'm going to move the player, it will move by himself. It's not actually moving in our game, right? I'm just moving it with my hand. But if I would take this sprite and place it inside the player. Nothing will happen here. You won't see any change, but now this sprite is a child of this player. So now because it's inside of it, if I was to move this player, not the sprite itself, but this player, the, the main parent, you can see that it's actually in the middle. Both of them will move because both of them are inside this one player object. And that's useful. We can do all kinds of things with that. So right now we're going to delete that and we're actually not going to use this player empty object. We're going to take this sprite and put it here. We're going to delete this game object and we're just going to leave this player sprite because we can still add components here and we can use this one as a game object by itself. So it has a sprite render. We can see a visual sprite on him, but we can also add other components here and do all kinds of things with him. So I think this episode was long enough. Again, we didn't do much. We didn't even get to coding, but that's fine. That's the purpose of this series. We really want to go slowly and learn everything and the more time you spend here in unity and get used to all of these things the better you don't need to rush anywhere 
because it won't help you if you rush and then just get stuck on something and then just quit. So right now we use the sprites again. We have more to do with that. We also need to actually move the player, not like that, because this is just me dragging the player around the scene. If I was to start the game, I can't really move the player. Look, I can't touch it. I can't interact with it. I can't even if I click on the keyboard, nothing happens because there is no code. There is nothing that tells this player and this character to move. So for that, we need some coding. And in the next episode, we're finally going to get into coding, into our scripts. And scripts are basically pieces of code that are controlling all these objects in our scene. So for example, we want to move this sprite, this game object. We need to create a script that tells him to move. And not only tells him to move, but where to move, when to move, how to move. So all these very simple things, things that seem simple when we play other games, all of these things are need to be taken into consideration when you're actually building a game because nothing is automatic. You can't move this character without actually telling him to do it, right? So in the next episode, we're going to learn coding. Uh, we're going to start with coding and it will be fun. It's actually the best part of Unity, the coding. It's really fun when you actually learn coding and you understand its uh, power and it's, it's really cool. So thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed and I'll see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode, we imported this character sheet and we learned how we can cut the separate sprites and then we also placed it inside our scene. In this episode, we're finally going to start with our first script with coding. We're going to take it very slowly. We're going to focus on the same script for a while until we actually learn the basic concepts of coding and then we're going to advance in our game and add more scripts and more things. So there is one thing that I forgot to tell you in the previous episodes is that we always need to make sure that we're saving the game. So whenever we do a small change, we're going to see this little asterisk appear over here. Okay. And what it means is that there been some changes in the project that we did not save. So whenever you see this little asterisk over here or even here next to the scene name, you need to know that something has changed. So it's very recommended to always save. Every time you actually can notice it, just save the project. Because if you're going to do some changes and sometimes you can do a lot of changes in a very short time, but then the program will crash or your PC will crash, then everything will be lost. So make sure you're saving as much as possible. And to save, of course, we go to file or save and not save project because these are two things. Save project is saving the entire project, but saving here will save the scene. So that's what we want. And when we click on save, we can see that this little asterisk is gone. So now there, there are no new changes. And we can also do it with control S if we don't want to go here and do it like that. We can just use the shortcut. So now when we do another little change, we can also see that it appears again. So this all happens here in the editor. But when we are going to write some code, we also need to save the scripts themselves. So that will be a different thing because we're using a different editor to write down the script. So we also need to make sure that we're saving inside the scripts and that we're saving the scene itself, because if we save the script, it won't save the scene. Okay. So in order to move our character and basically do everything, we need scripts and scripts are simply files that contain some code and the code will affect all kinds of game objects to do all kinds of things. Okay. So 
if we can see that we have this camera and we have this player sprite, there is no way to actually control them because when we go into the scene, into the game, there's no way to move them because we didn't create any logic for it. So that's why we use scripts to actually run and move everything in our scene and to set all kinds of conditions and to say what we want to do, when to do, how to do, how much to do. So all of these things, we need to write them down inside our scripts. So because this series is for absolute beginners, we're going to focus a lot on these codes. Okay, we're going to learn the basic coding elements that apply to coding languages in general and not only in C sharp that is used here in Unity. Okay, so we are going to work a little bit differently. Instead of just learning the coding script from scratch, just learning variables and then the different kinds of variables and then going up, like usually they teach coding languages, we're going to learn it as we are building this game, right? As we use Unity. Because each coding language has different purposes. When I went to learn app development, we learned Java and we learned Kotlin. So these are used to develop apps for the Android devices. And if you want to develop apps for iPhone, you need to learn Swift. So every coding language has different purposes. And right now we're not just learning C sharp just to know it. We're learning it to actually use it in Unity. So we already know the purpose of it. We already know the goal of it. That's why we're going to learn it differently because we are going to learn it in a way that we're going to be able to use it easily inside Unity. So it will be better because we're going to actually practice using it instead of just learning it theoretically, like usually people do when they study a separate coding language online or in a class, right? So right now we're actually going to also learn it and use it as we learn, okay? So in order to create a script, we simply go to this scripts folder. Again, this folder is something I created. So if you don't have it, you just click here on assets, right click, create and folder, and then you name it scripts. It doesn't have to be scripts. You can name it whatever you want, but scripts will be more obvious. So then we click on scripts and the folder is opened up right here. So then we right click, create C sharp script. And then we click on this one and we need to change the name. We need to set a name. But here there is something important. If I was to just press enter, it would save the name of the script as a default name, the new behavior. And then the actual script inside would also be called new behavior script. So even if now I'm going to change this to something else, for example, movement, it will not change the class inside. So there will be a bug, there will be an error. So if you don't know what happened and you did this mistake, know that it's because of that. So then just delete it and create a new script. And before you actually press enter or something, we need to give it a name. So we're going to call it player movement. Okay. Because we want to create a script to control the movement of our player. And then when we have the name, we just click somewhere or we press enter and it will save the name and it will also give the actual script inside this name, player movement. So now in order to actually code and write this script, we need to open it in an editor. So we double click on it. And if you don't have Visual Studio, it will just ask you to download it. It will show you your options, but you can actually use whatever editor you want. 
if you don't know about editors and you don't know how to uh, use different ones then just stick with Visual Studio because it's helpful and not all of the editors actually help us write the code. Visual Studio actually helps us write the code so I really recommend it. It will take some time to download the actual uh, file and then install it and then set everything but then you're going to have Visual Studio and then all you need to do is double click on it and it will open up in the code editor. So we use these code editors to write code, but we can actually write the code from any editor we want. We can also do it from a simple text file, right? The important part is the code that is inside of it. So we can see that we have the player movement opened up right here. And we can actually open many different scripts at the same time and then just go between them the same way we have different pages opened up in our internet browser, right? So we can just go between them. And the same thing applies here for the saving. So if I'm going to type something, we're going to see this little asterisk over here. It means that we didn't save our script. So again, file and save. But you can just press Control S and it will save it and this asterisk will be gone. So we're going to start writing this player movement script. And as we go, we're going to learn all the elements, all the basic things. So we will probably stay in this script for the next few lessons. So we can just get the very basic idea of coding. Because again, this series is meant for people that have zero experience in coding. So again, if you don't have the patience because you already have some experience and it feels very slow to you, then maybe you want to skip a few episodes or maybe you want to find another series, okay? So now we can see that we have this class over here. So this class is the big block of code and the way we can see that all of this is one block of code is because we have these brackets here, okay? We have this opening bracket and we have this closing bracket. And we can see that we have two more blocks of code over here because we can see two more sets of brackets, okay? So if we go here and we press enter, we can make it bigger, we can put more stuff inside, but this public class and we have the name of our script and we have mono behavior so it means that it inherits from mono behavior but right now we're not going to deal with inheritance because that's more advanced so we have this big block of code and that's the main block of code that all the other ones will go inside but again this is just the player movement so when we're going to create other scripts to do other things, we're going to call them differently and they will contain different information. So a class is basically just a collection of data that have something in common. So right now we want to write some code for the player movement. So we're going to have uh, the speed here, we're going to have the logic to actually move the player, when we want to move him, where we want to move him. So all of this has something to do with the player movement. That's why it's inside this class, right? And public just means that it's a public class. Again, we're not going to deal with public and all of that right now, but just know that it's a public class and because it's public, we can actually use it in other parts of our project, right? Because if it was private, then there was no actual way to go inside of it and use it. And here we also have some lines of code that are actually different libraries that we use. But again, we're not going to deal with that. You're going to have it when you open each new class and if we actually need to add another library we're going to 
add it here okay so we're going to go very slowly and we're going to learn all the small thing and again if you're not understanding something if you just get stuck on something you can always type in in the comments and ask me and i will definitely help you and that's a very big advantage because usually when you learn something in other places you don't always have the option to actually ask questions but i will always answer it especially now that this series is new but also after many years i hope that i will get these messages and i will be able to actually respond so inside this class we can see that we have these two methods okay we have this start method and we have this update method and methods or functions or just blocks of code that are separated right and whenever we call them they will simply run the code inside so we can see that this entire class is one big block of code but also these methods are also blocks of code but they're inside the class because we can see that we have the indentation so we have these brackets over here but the, these methods are inside of it right so if we would just copy it and place it outside of these brackets then we had this class and we had this function outside of the class but then it would give an error because usually we need to put these methods inside the class so that's not the way we're using it so let's put it back inside so different methods different functions will do different things and usually you can know what they do based on their name but in unity we have different types of methods so we have methods that we create because we want to do something specific and we're going to create a custom method in this script but they're also built in methods that are a part of unity and that are a part of mono behavior because we need to have them in order to do all kinds of things so for example that's the reason why we have this start method and this update method appear here when we create a new script because these are things that are built in with unity and they just place it here when we create these classes because we are going to probably use them and yes most of the time we're going to use a start method and an update method sometimes we don't need a start method sometimes we don't need an update method sometimes we don't even need both of them but most of the time we do need to use them that's why unity places them here at the beginning but we can also delete them and nothing will happen okay we can just do some other coding and now we can see that we have this void keyword here and i'm going to explain that later on in the series but basically it means that this method is not returning any data okay so when we call this method it will simply run the code inside it will not return any data and later on i'm going to explain to you exactly what it means and when we actually want to have a void and when we want to have something else okay so let's just delete this start and let's place this update over here and now let's start to actually add some information so each script each class will have a purpose but because we called it player movement and again we could have called it whatever we want the name of the class doesn't really do anything this is just so we know what it does so it will be easier to follow uh, when we have a lot of different scripts so we know what this script does it doesn't matter we don't have to call it player movement we could just call it movement or move or moving or whatever we want this is just for us okay 
but the reason we called it player movement is because we want to deal with the movement of our player. We're going to have more scripts that will deal with other things, but we want to deal with the movement of the player. Because right now if we, okay, the, there's some problems here because we don't have any code, so it doesn't let us play the game. But as we saw before, if we play the game, there is no way to move the object right we can move it in the scene we can take it and we can manually move it but when we run the game the character will not move because we didn't set any code to move it and that's what we want to do in this script so in order to actually move it we need to create some logic and the first thing we're going to create is a variable and we're going to call it speed so we're going to type in public float speed so we have three different things but we can see that there is something familiar here it looks exactly like this class right because we have the public keyword and then we have the type of item which is class but here it's a float and then we have the name so this is called player movement and this one is called speed. So that's the way, that's the order that it actually appears in public because it's a public piece of data that we can use uh, from outside of this script. Float, that's the type of variable and speed, that's the name of the variable. So again, speed, it's something I wrote down. We can call it whatever we want. This is just for us, so we know the name of it, okay? So what is a float? A float is a type of variable, and a variable, if I put it the simplest way, it's just a piece of data, okay? And we can store all kind of information inside this piece of data, okay? So a float, it's a piece of data that will usually store that will always store a number, but it will be a number with a decimal point, okay? So it will be something like that, 1.0. And usually when we assign a float, we also put an F at the end of it. So this is usually the kind of data that is stored inside floats. There is a different thing that is called an integer so we write it, it is an integer, but we write down int, and then we can give it a different name. Okay, speed. So in integers, we are storing numbers the same as here, but in integers, there will always be full numbers. So it will be one or five or four, 88, 45, any full number without a decimal point. But in floats, we can have 1.1, 30.5, 0 0.4, and things like that. And that's why we actually need two different types, because sometimes we only want to use full numbers. For example, we want to count from one to 10 and we only want 10 seconds, right? So we're going to put one, then two, then three, we want full numbers. But sometimes we want to be more flexible. So we actually need this decimal point. The best example is the actual location of objects. Because you can see that all of these values here, the positions are written down in floats. 1.15, 1.49, and the reason for this is that this is a more accurate way to get the position. If it was only integers, 1, 2, 3, then the player would be here, then 2, then 3. There was no in the middle, but we wanted to be in a very specific position. That's why we use floats. And here we can see 3.87, but there's actually more numbers to it that we are not seeing. It just rounds it up, okay? 
but we can just move it even a little bit and we can see that these numbers are changing and 3.92 is different from 3.93 even if we are not seeing it if it was a very small item and we would change it you can see it did move so we are using floats when we want a more accurate value right so integers just won't store it because for example if I was to save it as an integer so here we created the speed variable right but we didn't assign a number to it but to assign an actual value to it we can put these assigning operator and then type in for example one okay so we want the speed to be one and that's fine and it will work but if for example because we don't have to put a point zero okay we don't have to do that and if we do that we do have to put an f okay but we don't have to do it we can also put a full number and it will still work because it knows okay if i need to use the decimal point i will be able to use it because it's a float but if for example we're using a decimal point but we are even if we put this but we're changing it to an integer it won't work you see there's an error so this red line means that there's some kind of error okay and to make your life easier the good thing about visual studio and usually many other coding editors they actually help us understand coding just by giving us all kinds of information so if we can see that there's some kind of error here with this red line we can simply hover here and it will say the exact problem so it says cannot implicitly convert type float to int okay so what it means it means that we cannot store a float inside a value inside a variable that is actually an int so there's a problem we need to change it we also can actually let the editor fix this problem for ourselves we can go here and press alt plus enter or click on this show potential fixes and then it tells us what we can do and you can see here it gives us an example of what we can do so one thing we can do is to actually convert this thing into an integer so we're using an end here and this and it's called casting but again it's a little bit more advanced so you're not going to deal with that right now and we don't really need to use this it's just a way to fix our problem but there's no need to even get to this problem because if we want to use a float we simply make it a float okay so now we have this variable here okay a piece of information that is called speed the type of it is float so it means that we can store numbers with a decimal point and it's public so it means that we can use it outside of this code and we also set a value so we don't always have to set a value when we create a variable if we want the value to be 1.5 and we just want it to always be 1.5 then yes we can put a value right now but if we want to change the speed later on and we want to test different speeds we can simply leave it like that and then we can change the speed later on we can change it later on in the code or we can actually change it from within the inspector panel so if we click on our player right now there is no script on him but if we take this player movement script and we drag it on our player we're going to see that we have a new component which is this script okay and if we're actually going to save it because right now it's not saved and we're going to go back into unity it will compute it for a few seconds and then we can actually see that now there's a speed variable over here in this player movement component and 
now we can also change the actual speed right here. And the reason it happened is because we made the speed public. So it means that we can actually access this class from this inspector and we can change the value. If we would put it as private and save, then we won't be able to change the speed and we won't be able to even see the speed over here. It will still exist, but only inside this class and only this class can actually use it or change it. Okay, so we can't do anything from outside. We can also just leave it this way. Okay, so if we don't specify private or public, it will be private. Okay, people usually write private, so it will be obvious. Okay, but if you leave it like this, it will be private. So now we have this float, which is speed. So we're going to use this variable to actually control the speed. But this is just a small piece of information, right? Because also in a car, even if we have the speed we want, we still need wheels, we still need the engine, we still need a lot of parts to actually move. So it's not enough to just have this piece of data. This piece of data is simply storing a certain value. So we are going to use this speed, this variable later on in our code, but the speed itself doesn't do anything. The next thing we want to add is something called a vector. So I know you're going to really get frustrated around it at the beginning because it's something very unfriendly for beginners. Although it's not that complicated when you actually understand what it is. So we're going to create a private vector two, and we're going to call it change. Okay. So this variable will be our change. We're going to actually keep track of the position changing. So we're going to store this information inside this vector. So again, it's a different type of variable. It is a vector and this is the type and this is the name change. Okay. And this one is private because we don't really want to see it in the inspector. We're not going to change it in the inspector. We're going to use it here. So it's private. Okay. So I'm going to really try to explain to you what a vector is. Although, again, it's not easy for beginners because it's a bit more complicated to understand, especially if you're just starting out from zero and you're just learning about basic uh, floats and integers and all. So it will be harder, but I'm going to try to explain it the best as I can. I'm not going to focus on it too much right now. I also provided a link to a nice video that actually explains what vector are. So maybe it will really help you. If you really want to understand everything and all the technical things, you can watch the video and learn about vectors. But the basic idea of vectors is that they just store some information the same way we have this float store a speed value. Vectors, they store some information and usually we're storing a position inside vectors. Okay. So we have this information here. We have the X position and we have the Y position, right? So X is simply the position of the object on the X axis. So we see this red line here, this red arrow, that's the X axis. Okay. And this green one is the Y axis, right? So if we move him up, we can see that it changes on the Y axis. If we move him down, it will go to negative because zero, zero is this spot, which is the middle of the screen. And also our camera is zero, zero in the middle of the screen. And the sprite is in the middle of the middle. 
So it's zero, zero, okay? And it's also zero on the z-axis, but as I told you, it's a 2D project, so we are not concerned with the z-value, okay? But this is just the positioning of the object in the world. And if I'm going to move it on the x-axis to the right, it will get a positive value. If I'm going to move it to the left, it will get a negative value because that's the axis. So zero is here, plus one is here, minus one is here, minus two is here, minus three is here. So that's the way we're moving, you can see. And the same way with Y. But you maybe remember it from geometry in school that we had our axis, the Y and X axis, and we could draw all kinds of figures using these coordinates, right? So we had something like that. We had a value here and we had a value here. So usually this one was the X and this one was the Y. So this simply meant that it's on the X axis on the second point and on the Y axis, it's on the second point as well. So it means that it's somewhere here, okay? So a vector is simply something that holds these positions. It holds an X value and a Y value, okay? So we can visually imagine a vector as something like that, okay? X and Y. Oh, what's this? X and Y, okay? It will hold an X variable and it will hold a Y variable. And usually these variables are floats because as I told you, we want to be accurate and you can see that when we move it, we have a decimal point. So these values are floats because we want to be more accurate, right? So that's a vector. It simply stores information. We can do more things with vectors. So a vector can also hold a position, but we can also use these values to calculate different things like the distance or things like that. But that's more advanced and I'm not going to go into it. If you're going to watch the video that I provided in the description, then they will explain everything. Okay? So we have vector 2, but we also have vector 3. And the difference is that vector 3 holds three values, X, Y, and Z. But because we are in a 2D project, we don't need the Z. So we're simply going to use vector two because we only want to store the X position and the Y position, okay? But because things are a little bit more complicated in coding, we are still going to use vector three and I'm going to explain to you why, because there's a reason, but we can also use vector two. So again, just bear with me and you're going to understand everything eventually, okay? So now we have a vector three, which is called change. And remember, I'm going to type it down. So another thing we can learn is if, for example, we want to write some information, maybe we want something to remind ourselves later on, we can just place these two slashes here. We need to put two of them and then it becomes gray, okay? So everything we write inside will just be considered as a comment, okay? So for example, we wrote down this thing here and right now it's pretty obvious that it's speed because it says speed. But if it was something harder to understand or to remember, we could just type in the speed of the player. So if we would come back to the script and we would not remember what it does, we can simply read this comment and understand what it does. Or for example, if two people or more than two people would work on the same code, when we have these comments, we can actually understand what the other person did here. So if we also want to disable this part, we can just put these two lines and it will become gray. So the editor will just ignore this line of code. So I'm going to use this comment on this little image here. So we're going to remember that vector three is actually three different values and it stores an X, a Y and Z, okay? 
So right now, this variable here is empty, okay? We just created this variable. It's empty. The same way speed is empty. So change is empty. We don't know what is the position. We are just creating an empty vector tree, which is called change, okay? So we know that eventually we're going to put some information inside of it, which will be X, Y, and Z, okay? So this episode is starting to get long, and I know that we only wrote down like two lines here, but that's fine because we're not in a hurry. We're not in a hurry to build this game that's not this kind of series. We're not trying to build a game. We're going to eventually build a game, but the important part of this series is to actually understand coding and understand the very basic things so later on you're going to be able to build your own games with your own code and not just copy some other guy's code right or girls right we want to really understand what every line of code does that's why especially for absolute beginners we want to understand everything so we learned what a variable is we learned what a float is, what an integer is. We also learned vectors, which are a bit more complicated, but we just need them in this script. So I also show them to you. Not all coding languages use vectors. Floats, you can find them in most of coding languages, right? Integers, other types of variables. But vectors is something that is very specific to Unity and it's just a type of struct so you can see it's like a structure so we can place three different values but that's it the way we can actually create a vector is to simply do something like that private float x private float y private float z so these are the names. It's a bit messy here because there's these lines, but this is the X, this is the Y, this is the Z. We created three different floats and we can use them separately to do the same thing we would do with this vector tree. That's it, right? Because we just separated these values, but we're using a vector because it's much easier to just type in one line of code and then use it in different parts of the code instead of just creating three different floats and then getting lost with them. That's why we use a vector because it's just easier to work with. But we could do the same thing like that, okay? And for example, we want to know what the X of this vector is. We can simply say change, no, we can simply say change dot X equals to two okay so again we can't do it here because it's just the beginning of the script it's not inside a method but if we're going to take this and put it in a method it would actually work so we're assigning the value of two inside change x dot x means that the x value that is inside change so after we do this, this vector will actually look like that. It will be, the X will be two, the Y will be unknown and Z will be unknown, right? So we actually still need to put all of these values. Otherwise there will be an error, but we can do it like that. And then we can also add the Y and the Z, right? So that's, vectors so we learn these things and there are more basic variables that we need to learn about for example booleans and strings and other things but as i told you we're not going to do it the old-fashioned way that we learn everything uh, by this uh, stages one after one we're going to learn things as we actually write the script and we actually build this game, okay? I will try to actually make it basic things and then go to more advanced things, but if we're not using a bool here, I'm going to teach you about booleans when we actually use a boolean, because that way 
you can actually understand and see how they work instead of just explaining them to you, okay? But for now, we have this public float variable that is called speed, and we have this vector, which is basically just three different floats, and this combination here is called change, okay? And these are the two variables we're going to use in this script. So in the next episode, we're going to actually go inside our update method and we're going to see how we can actually start moving things and start building some logic. Okay, because here we just learn about the blocks of the code, but here we're going to actually build the code. So little by little, we're going to finish this script and we're going to add more and more scripts and more objects and we're going to get somewhere. But the most important part is that you actually understand these basic things because you're actually learning to code. So thank you for watching and please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. You can also click on the little bell so it will actually notify you when the next episode comes out. I'm going to have many other series on Unity for different kinds of games and different things. So I really recommend you to subscribe and of course it will really help me and support me. So see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode, we started with coding and we learned a little bit about floats and integers. We also learned about vectors but I didn't really have a chance to explain how we can use variables and why we even need them. So in coding, everything is about values. It's about putting values inside containers and then putting these containers inside other containers. So variables are basically these containers that we store values inside of them. Because if we're going to store a value inside speed, we can use speed as a variable to do different calculations later on, okay? So let me just give you an example. Let's say we have a private integer, which is apple, and we have a private integer banana, okay? And right now we want to put some prices to them. So let's put $3 inside Apple, right? We have the assign operator. So it means that whatever is on the right side will go and be stored inside the left element. Okay. So the value of three will go inside Apple and now Apple will be three. So I said that it's the price, but we don't really know it's the price, right? We don't know that it's dollars. We just put a value of three and we're going to do the same thing with bananas, but we're going to put it four. So if we want to calculate something simple like the price of these two fruits, we can just create another integer and call it total price. Okay. And notice the way I wrote down the name of the variable. The first letter is a lowercase, but the first letter of the second word is uppercase. And that's called camel case. And that's usually the way we give variable names in coding. Okay, so you can write it the way you want, but that's the standard. Okay, because if I was to do something like that, it would be hard to read, right? Total price. And if we have like a long word that will be weird but when we put the capital letter on the second word it's easier for the eye of course you can also do something like that and it will be fine but that's usually how it's done so now we created this total price variable and in the beginning it's empty but then we can store some values inside of it okay so i'm simply copying it and now we can put some values inside of it. So you saw that I created the variable over here. I specified 
that it's an int and then I can use the same variable to put values inside of it. I can also do it right here. I can put the values right when I create the variable, but I can also put the variables later on in the script. So I can do it whenever I want. It's the same way here. We created speed, but we're not going to place any value inside of it. We're going to do that later on in the code. But if we did not create the variable, it will give us an error because we do need to create it first and specify the type. And also at the end of the line of code, we are putting this semicolon because in C sharp, that's the way we tell the code that we finished our line. Okay. The same way that we use a point at the end of a sentence. Okay. So in other coding languages, we use different things. Some coding languages, we don't even need to do that. But in C sharp, we need to put this semicolon. Okay. Otherwise, it will give us an error. So we created this total price and then we want to check the price of this apple and banana. And the reason we actually use variables is because we no longer need to use the actual values. We can simply use the variables themselves. So we can put here apple plus banana. And because we use the same exact name, it's connected now to this variable. So now it says apple and banana, but it's actually three and four, right? Because the apple stores this number, the banana stores this number. So right here, there's simply a box that stores number three. And here there's a box that stores number four. So the total price will be seven because three plus four is seven. And the operators work the same way like in school. We take this and we add something to it. And it works the same way if we have a multiplier. For example, we had here another apple. It would be this first, right? We first we multiply and only after that we use the addition operator. So all of these things are the same as school, right? There's this order. So it will take the value of the apple and it will add it to the value of the banana and it will be seven together. And then the seven will go inside total price. So total price will be seven right now. And then we can do something else. For example, we can add another apple to it. So total price and notice how when we start to write the code, Visual Studio actually offers us to autocomplete it. So we can just press enter and we'll autocomplete it because it will search for all the variables we have and we'll see maybe we're trying to type this one. So it will just offer it for us. Okay. So total price is equals to total price plus Apple. So what we're doing here, we're taking the old total price and we're adding another apple to it. So if this one was seven, then this one is seven, but now we're adding another apple. So it's seven plus three, it will be 10. Okay. So right here, total price became seven, but here, total price became 10 because we added another apple to it. And the way we're doing this is simply taking the older total price and adding an apple. We can also do something like that. It depends on you, the way you want to write it down. We can do total price plus equals apple. Okay. So it will take the total price and we'll just add an apple to it. So it's plus equals. And it's the same way if we do it like this. There's no difference. That's just a different way. Because here we just take the total price and we add an apple. And we take all of this and we place it inside total price. But if we do it like this, we're just doing the same thing. We're just adding the apple to the total price. So it's 7. And here 3 plus 7 will be 10. 
right? But let's just leave it this way because it's much easier to understand it. And that's the way we actually use variables. Of course, these are very simple calculations, but in coding we do very complicated calculations with different types of variables. And of course, we're not just adding, we can also decrease, we can divide, we can multiply, we can do whatever we want, okay? And it gets way more complicated depending on the calculation, but that's the very basic way we use variables. So another thing I wanted to show you, and it's something usually people don't learn when they start coding, but it will be very helpful if you make it a habit to use it. And that's the debugging tool, debug.log. So I know you might say, what the hell is debugging? I'm just a beginner. It's fine. Debugging is just the process of finding bugs in our code and getting rid of them, okay? And bugs are simply errors and things that cause our program not to work or to work in a bad way. So we have different tools to find these bugs, but a very useful tool is this debug log. And what this tool does is simply take the data we put inside, inside of these two brackets, and it simply shows it to us when we run the game. And it shows it in this console panel, okay? So maybe it will be here when you just install Unity. Maybe you need to go to window and find it over here. Uh, let's see where it is. here, general and console. So if you don't see it, you can click on this and then you will see it. And usually it's just over here. So if you don't see it, you will get the data over here and then you just click on this part and we'll just open it up, okay? So it will send the data over here and we can see what happens inside our code when the game runs. Because right now we can't see what happens. If we're not creating some kind of text and connecting the data to the screen to actually see it, we won't be able to see what happens inside, right? We do have the inspector, but that's just to see the different variables. But what about variables that just go through different calculations? Maybe we want to check what happens to this variable on this line and what happens to this variable on another line. So that's why we can use the debug log not only to find bugs, but just to keep track of our code. So for example, we know that total price is seven right here because we can see that apple is three and banana is four, so it's seven. We know it, but we can't really see it visually, right? And we know the total price is 10 on this line because we know that seven plus three is 10. But if we want to see what happens, because sometimes the calculations or way more complicated. So we can just put the debug log over here and put it over here and then place the total price inside of it. So then when we're going to run the game, it will show what is the value of total price, okay? I placed all of that in the update method. It's not a good idea because it will just show it a lot of times. So let's place it in the start method. And I'm going to explain what these methods are all about just in a moment. So let's place all of that in the start method. So it will run only once. Okay, the start method runs only once, but the update method runs a lot of times and I'm going to explain how it happens but now it will run this code but while it's running this code it will also show it in the console okay because we placed it here and the debug log so it's not interfering with the calculation it will do this calculation and it will do this calculation and we can do many other things but this line here is just to get an idea of what is the actual value of it. And this way we can 
keep track of our code, okay? So now it will show 7 and then it will show 10, okay? So let's run the game. And we go to the console and we can see 7 and 10, okay? And it's very useful. Again, in much more difficult calculations, it will really help us figure out things. So if we click on it, it also shows us which debug log it, it displays, okay? It says player movement script, line 24. So if we click on it, it will actually bring us here to line 24. So we know that this debug is number 7. So this price is 7. We also don't need to really keep track of the lines, right? We can simply type it inside. We can put a string. So we didn't learn about strings. We're going to learn about them. We can put a string and say, this is the first price. And here we can say, this is the second price. Price. Okay, so we're simply creating a string and we're typing in some uh, words and we're adding the same total price. So it will show us this information and then it will show us the value of this variable. So the first one, it will show 7 and the second one, it will show 10. But now we don't need to really get lost and say, okay, what is the line? We can just know because we wrote down what is this price, okay? So now when we run it, just clear it. We can click on clear and it will clear all this information. Let's just run it again. Console. And we can see the, the, the is. What did I write here? The is, what? Oh, the first price. I don't know why I did that. And I didn't smoke today. Let me assure you. Okay, the second price. Okay, that was weird. So, let's run it. Okay. The first price is 7. The second price is 10. So, you can see it just replaced the total price with the actual value. So this way we can keep track of our code and figure out things, especially when we have errors. And we're going to use this debug log a lot, so you're going to get used to it. And that's a very good thing to use, and many people don't use it. Even people that have more experience in Unity don't really use it, and it's very helpful. So let's just get rid of that and get rid of that and actually get rid of all of these examples. Okay, so now we have a basic idea of how these variables work and what we can do with them. And of course, there's a lot more to it, but that's the basic idea. So now I just want to talk about these methods. I told you that we're going to start coding the rest of this script, but it's very important for you to understand these basic things, and then we can actually start coding the rest of this uh, script, okay? So what are these methods? We talked about these methods in the previous episode a little bit, right? But a method is basically just a block of code that will run at a certain time. And the reason we need these methods is because that's the only place inside the class that we can run the code. We can't run the code over here. We can't say speed equals 12 and a half. It will give us an error, okay? Because this is not the place to run the code. We can create variables and different data types over here but we cannot run code. We can only run code inside methods. And the reason for that is that methods know when they 
need to run. Okay, there's some kind of order. If I was to write some code over here, first of all, it wouldn't let me, but it wouldn't know when to run the code. Inside methods, it will work because the, the, the class and the entire system knows which method needs to come first. Okay, so there's this order. And that's why that's the only place we can run the code. So these two methods here, the start and the update, are built-in methods that come with Unity. But we can actually create many more methods, many more custom methods. Void my method, okay? Of course, we need to make it one word. Uh, so I can create a hundred more methods and do different things with them. But these methods are built-in methods. And the reason they're built in is because they actually tell us when they will happen. So we have the start method and this start method will run its code at the beginning of the game. So if this player movement is located on this player, and it is right now, we can see the player movement script is a component on this game object. And this game object is active, right? We can also click here on this little box here and make it unactive, right? So now it became gray. We are not seeing this uh, game object in our scene and there's no V here. So now this game object is not active. So the start method will not run. Even if we start the game, the start method will not run. But if we put it back here and we make it visible, then when we start the game, the start method will run and that's the first thing that will run. Well, actually, that's not the first thing. The first thing is another built-in method that is called awake, okay? And the awake is the first thing that will run when we start our game. So each game object that has a script on it if that script has an awake method, it's the first thing that will run in this script, okay? The important thing to understand is that the start method will run after the awake method, okay? So the awake method and the start method only run once. First is the awake, then the start. But maybe you're not going to even see an awake method. It's not something we have to use. Many scripts won't have the awake method, right? Many scripts won't have the start method. But the awake method is just something we can use to run some code before the start method, okay? And it will run the code once. And then the start method will run and it will run once. And then after the start method did all the coding once, it will go to the update method and the update method will run every single frame, okay, for the rest of the game. So what does it mean that it will run every single frame? So let me give you an example of how it works. First of all, in the start method, let's just put a debug. and say, this is the start method, okay? So when we see this line of code in the console, we know that it actually run this method, okay? But in the update method, we can put the same line and say, update, and let's see what happens. If I run the game, look what happens. It keeps running. You can see these numbers here. It means that you see the list. It's not stopping. The update method just runs again and again and again. The first thing we see here is this is the start method. So we know that the first thing that happened was this block of code. So this debug. But after this ran only once, then the update method will start running every frame. Okay, so we can see it, it keeps going. 
right? It's not stopping. So let's stop the game. So what does it mean? If this update method runs every frame, and we know that games have different uh, frame rates, right? Some games run on 30 frames per second. Other games run on 60 frames per second. There are games that run on higher frame rates, right? And it means that there are 30 frames every second. It means that this update method will run 30 times in one second. So it's a lot, right? Or if the game has a higher FPS, it will run 60 times in one second. So in the update, we do all kinds of things that we want to happen a lot. For example, movement. We're not going to change the movement of the player in the start method because the start method will only run once in the beginning. We want to do the movement, for example, in our update method because the update method will run every frame. So we can move the player every frame, right? We don't want to move the player just at the start of the game. We want to move him every frame. So we do all of this coding inside update. Or for example, we want something to happen when we press on a certain key. So we need to place it inside update and say, okay, wait and check if I actually press on a certain key. And if I'm pressing this key, then do something. But if we're going to place it in the start method, it will just check it at the beginning of the game. And later on, it won't check it because this code will not run. This code is running only at the beginning, but this code runs every frame. And we can also see it visually. For example, let's put, let's create a variable. Let's call it private int and call it frame, okay? And then let's put the frame here and say that every time the update method runs, it means every frame, just take the frame and add another number to it, right? So it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Each time this code will run, it will add one to the frame because here it's zero, right? It's not, let's just specify it. So here it's zero. And then when the update will run, it will increase it by one, okay? And we can also see it happen in life if we use the debug. So we can use the debug and say, show me what the frame value is, okay? So now we're going to see live what is the value of frame. And we can see that we're adding one each frame. So let's see what happens. Play. We can see here, this is the live counter. 170, 180, 140, 200 and 300. You can see it runs very fast because it increases it by one every frame. Not every second, every frame. So that's why it's so fast. And we can see that if we run the game, we can also go here. Here, stats. So we can see that it runs on 36 FPS. So 38 FPS, something like that. Right? So that's why we see that it runs so fast. Because it actually adds one to it every frame so we have about 37 frames every second so every second it will add one to it right because it just runs this block of code every frame so then you say okay but that's not very accurate what if one person runs it on 30 and another runs it on 100 fps then it will be weird and that's right. That's why we use something called time, delta time. Okay. So of course we need to change it to float because it works with floats. So let's change the frame to float. 
So this time delta time is something we usually use when we want to make the speed or the values be consistent with the frame rate. Because if it's going to run 30 times every second and for another person it will run 60 times every second, the game will look weird, right? For one person it will be slow, for the other person it will be faster. And we don't want this, we want that the speed will be the exact same speed for every person. So it doesn't matter what is the FPS. So that's why we use this time delta time. We just multiply the value by time delta time. And time is just a class. Okay. And delta time is the completion time in seconds since the last frame. Okay. So you don't need to understand the exact way it works. The exact definition of it. But we're just going to see it live. It means that right now it will run this value, it will increase it by one, not every frame, but every second. Okay, so let's see how it works. You remember that before it actually add one every, like 30 times every second, right? Because it was dependent on the frame rate. But now it will add one to it every second. So the update will still run every frame, right? If we run on a thousand FPS, it will run the update method a thousand times every second. But this code here, this value here, will be consistent with the frame rate. So it doesn't matter what the frame rate is, it will just run the same way, okay? And we can see that, let's see, run we can see over here four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's actually a second, right? So it doesn't matter. Look, we are running it on 40 FPS and it's adding one every second, not every frame. That's why we use this time delta time, okay? So we saw what the start method is, we saw what the update method is, and we understand now, because it's not obvious, many people have a lot of experience in Unity, and they don't really know how this update method works, and they don't understand why we need to use time delta time. They use it because they know they need to use it, but they don't really understand why they use it. But this is just the very basic understanding of this method. Later on, we're going to actually write code here. So we're going to see how it works. So we learned that we have these built in methods. And what's special about them is that they actually tell us when they run and we can and we need to use them accordingly. OK, but then there are our custom methods. So methods that we want to create for different purposes. For example, I want to create a method to calculate something. Calculate price. So you can see that method names, we can use capital letters, right? So it will be easier to distinguish between them and variables. So we can create a custom method to calculate the price or something. And we can do as many as we want. But now there's a question. So when do these run? We know that the start method runs at the start. We know that the update method runs every frame. But when do these custom methods run? These custom methods will only run when we tell them to run. Okay? And the way we actually call them, okay? Call them, it means that we actually run them is simply by calling their name. So for example, we have the start method. And we want this method to run at the beginning of the game. So all we need to do is take the name of this method and place it here and put 
a semicolon. So right here we don't have these brackets because we don't need to write any code. We're just calling this method, okay? And then it will start, it will run this code right at the beginning of the game. It will start the start method, it will search for some code, and it will reach this line, and it will know, okay, I need to run, I need to call this method. And then it will simply go here and it will run the code that is inside this method. And when all of this code finished running, it will come back here and it will just continue with these lines okay so if there will be another thing here it will first do this it will call it it will go here it will run this code and when this code is finished it will come back here to the next line and it will go to this code okay but remember if we place this method in the start label it will only call it once at the beginning of the game if we place this method and we call it in the update method, it will run it every frame. So we can also see how it works. We can go to this calculate price and simply say int price equals to apple plus banana and before that also apple equals 5 and banana equals 5 okay so the price should be 10 and then we simply use the debug log so we can actually see the price visually and we place the price inside so the price should be 10 so all this method does is calculate the price and shows us the price in the console but now when will it run this code it will run this code because if i was to just take this code and run the game like that even though we have this code over here it will not run the code okay let's see it we don't have it here we don't have it here we do have this debug log i saved it Let's run it. Let's just delete all of that because that's from earlier. Let's run. There's nothing here. There's nothing in the console. Why? We have this debug log. Why we can't see the price in the console? Well, because we didn't even call this method. We created it, okay? We created it inside the class, but it doesn't know when to run this code. Because as we said, every method has a certain time to run. This will run at the start. This will run every frame. But this one is a custom method. So we need to call it. But we're not calling it. We're not calling it in the start. We're not calling it in the update. And this is just a method by itself. So in order to actually call it, we need to call it or start or update. If we place it in the update and we call it in the update, it will go and call it every frame. So now let's save. Let's go here. Let's restart, play, and we can see that it actually runs it every frame. 10 10 10 10 10 and it keeps doing it every frame so it's not stopping you can see it keeps going and printing it frame after frame 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 because it goes to the update method and the update method runs every frame so it just runs and calls this method every frame so methods that we created by ourselves, we have to call them by ourselves, okay? Unity will not know when they should run without us calling them, okay? So 
now that we actually learned about methods and how to use them, we learned about variables. In the next episode, I promise we're going to continue with this script and write the code to finally move our player. Yes, it is a series for beginners and the important part is to learn the basics, but we also want to continue with our game and we don't want our player to just stand here. We want to be able to move him because that's the whole point of gaming. We want to be able to do something. We want to be able to use this code to run this visual object, okay? We want to run the game and we want to be able to control the player we want to be able to do all kinds of things so thank you for watching please subscribe if you still did not subscribe it will help me a lot it will also help you keep track of every new episode so see you next time hello there and welcome back in the previous episode we learned a bit more about variables we also learned about methods and how we are actually using them in coding and that methods are used to execute some code in a specific time so we have built-in methods like update and start that happen in a specific time and we have custom methods that happen that run whenever we call them and they will not run if we are not calling them okay so in this episode we're going to continue with the player movement script and after we finish the script, we're going to go back into Unity and do some things that are more related to the actual software. And we're always going to go back into the code and go back into Unity. So we're going to learn both of these things simultaneously. But the code is very important because most people get stuck on the code. They're not getting stuck on the software because the software even if it has all these different features, it's pretty easy. But the code is where people get stuck because they can't understand it. Not only that they can't understand it, but they can't just go forward and build their own code. Maybe they can copy some code and they, they can understand it, but they cannot build their own code. And then they just get stuck and they quit. So learning the code is the thing that will ensure you that you will actually progress more than just the average person that starts and quits okay so that's why i really want to make sure we're learning the code very good and unity will just happen by itself we're definitely going to use all that we can and we're going to see different features like animations and things like that but we're going to focus on coding as much as we can, okay? So in order to continue with our player movement script, we need to write more code, of course. So right now we have a variable that will control the speed. We have a variable that will store some values to keep track of some position, right? And what we want to do is to actually move our player and we're going to see how we can do it. So I'm going to do it a bit different. I'm going to start from the end and I'm going to go backwards. Okay, so I'm going to write the last line of code, which is the line that will actually move our player. And then we're going to build all the things that are required for that line. Okay, so I'm going to start by creating a custom method void. I'm going to call it move character character and again I did explain about methods but I did not explain about what void is I told you that it's a method that is not returning a value but when we're going to actually reach a method that returns a value I'm going to explain more but right now we don't need it just know that it's just a method that will run its code that's it so we have this custom method that is called move character and here we're going to do this line of code that will move our character but we're going to call this method from within the update method so it will get called every frame 
And then you may ask, so why are you not just putting this code inside the update method? And it will work if I do it. But that's the reason we use these custom methods because we want to divide our code. We don't want a lot of code to fill up our update method and then everything will get messy. We want to divide it to separate sections so it will be very organized and it will save us time searching for all kinds of things. So if we want to do some code that it actually moves the player, we're going to place it here. And if we want to do something in the update that happens before that, we're going to place it before it. And if we want something to happen after, we're going to place it after. But this way we can actually know that the code that moves the character will be inside this method. Okay? So the code that moves this character will be just this one line for now. And we're going to type in transform position equals to transform position plus change multiplied by speed multiplied by time delta time okay so now i'm going to explain exactly what i did here so the transform is the transform component on our game object right because this script is on the player right we can see it visually here if we click on the player we can see that we have this player movement script on the player we can also see the speed variable and we can see the script attached to it okay we can also see the transform component over here and every game object has this transform so when we type in transform we mean the transform attached to this game object it's pretty simple it actually tells us what it is. You can hover over something and it will tell us the transform attached to this game object. And what it means by this game object, it means the game object that this script is on. Okay. So in our case, it's the player. So we're taking the transform and the transform component is the one that takes care of all of the positioning, all of the rotation, the scale, so we're going to use it to move our player. And then we put this little dot and position. So we go into the position of the transform. The world space position of the transform. And we can also see it visually. We have the transform component here. And then we have its position. So the position is just one part of this transform and we can see that it has different values right now it's zero because we're in the middle of the scene but we can also move it and it will change its value so we're simply going inside the position of the transform which is the transform of this script which is the player right and then we take it we take this position and we say that whenever we run this code, the move character code, the transform position will become something else. We're going to change it because we put this assign operator, right? The same way, like if we did here and we said speed is now equals to 12, right? We want to change the value of this variable. So we just take this operator. It means that this value goes inside this variable from right to left. So the same way here, it may look long and scary, but it's pretty simple. We take all of this information, all of this information, all of this calculation will result in a value. And then we store this value inside this transform position. Okay, so I told you about the debug log, right? That we can use it to check out different parts of our code and we can use it to help us. So we're going to use it to actually help us understand what is going on here. So before we do something, before we run anything, let's just understand what happens here. We can add this 
debug log, okay? And we want to see what happens inside the transform position. We want to see what is this value, right? Because we want to change it. So what is this value? How it looks like? Let's copy this, place it inside this debug log. And remember, because we're calling it from the update, it will run it every frame. So we're going to see a lot of it, but it's not going to change because we're still not moving. So let's play. And we can see here on the bottom left side, or we can just go into the console. It says zero, 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 right? Because it simply stores these values, the X position, the Y position, and the Z position. So it's 0, 0.0 because it's a float, right? Remember, floats are numbers with a decimal point. So it means that the X is 0, the Y is 0, and the Z is 0. And it's right because our player, we can see if we click on the player, the position over here, it's 0, 0, 0. So it simply shows us the position of the transform, right? It's zero, zero, zero. So the transform position right now is zero, zero, zero. That's it. And what we're actually trying to do, we're trying to move our player. And to move our player, we need to do something to change its position, right? So if we want to move it to the right, you can see the X position is changing. And if we're going to move it to the top, then also the Y position is changing. If we move it down, it will go minus, it will go negative. If we move the X position to the left, it will be negative. So if it's not in the center point of the screen, which is zero, zero, it's just the position, it's like the GPS coordinate, right, of this item. So every point on the map will have a different coordinate, a different X and a different Y, exactly with these lines, like I told you, like I showed you, with the X axis and the Y axis. Each position will have different values, okay? And what we're trying to do, because if he is standing on zero, zero, we're simply going to change the position, the X or the Y, and it will move the player, right? And remember, we're not changing the Z because it's a 2D project. We're not moving him inside. You can see that if I'm changing the Z, we're not going to see it because he moves in two the scene and we can't see it because it's a 2D project. But if we're changing the X value or the Y value, it actually moves our character. So it doesn't matter if he actually stands on zero, zero, right? Because other items will be in a different place. Not all items will be in the middle. They don't have to be in the middle. Usually they won't be in the middle. They will be in a random position like 11 and five. But if we run the game, it will show us these coordinates because this is the position, right? The transform position. Let's run it. And you can see 11.3 and 5.1. 11.3 and 5.1. It looks a little different because it just rounds up the numbers, right? It rounds up to 30. It rounds it down to 5.1. And the Z, it also rounds it up, although we're not going to even change it. So let's just put it back to zero. So it will simply show us the transform position. And now we're trying to change the position. So we're saying that the new transform position will be the transform position, which is zero, 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 plus another value multiplied by another value multiplied by another value. So all of this calculation will change the position of the transform. And then it will all go inside the transform position and it will simply move our character because the transform position will be different. 
right? And because it happens in the update method, it means that it happens every frame. So we're not going to see something like that. Okay, he's not going to just appear or teleport himself here, but he's going to move there and will look very smooth and natural because it happens every frame. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. And we're taking these values, the original transform, the position that the player is at now, and we're simply adding to this transform position. So we're moving it, okay? We're changing it. And for example, we're going to do it very simply. We're going to put some change and the change can be anything. The change is this vector, right? So this change will have some change that happens to the transform position. So we need to change this change, okay? And then we're going to multiply it by speed because if there is no speed, so if it's zero, it will be multiplied by zero and then he's not going to move. But if we're going to multiply it by one, for example, so if speed will be one, then all of this will be multiplied by one. So it will just move by a certain speed. But if we're multiplying it by, let's say, a speed of five, that will move much faster. Okay, that's why the speed actually makes it faster. But let's see how it works, okay? Because right now we don't have this change. We only created this vector, but there are no values. And how do we actually press on something and we make the player move? So all of this we're going to do here before we move the character. Because right now we can't move him. There is no change, okay? He is not going to move. The change is zero, right? Because when we created this vector, we didn't set any value. So now it's zero. So it means it will just add zero to it. And if it adds zero to it, it doesn't add anything. So the player is not moving, right? So here we're going to check if the player is actually pressing or something. So first of all, we're going to say that change is vector three, zero. So all we're doing here is just resetting the change to zero. It means you can see shorthand for writing vector three, zero, zero, zero. And the reason we're resetting the values of change is because we want to get a new change, okay? Because suddenly the player will move up or move to the left or move down. Okay, so we need to check if he actually changed the direction each frame. That's why we're resetting it each time. And then we can actually check if a player clicked on something. So we're going to take the change X. So this is simply the X value of change, right? Because it's a vector tree and it has these three values. So we're simply going to change the X. So we're doing change dot X and we're going to change the value into something. And the something will be input get axis raw and we're simply getting the axis of the horizontal so what it means it means that all the keys that are associated with horizontal if the player presses on them it will give us a value and then this value will go into change x okay so if we go here into edit project settings and then we go into input manager we can see that we have different axes so we have this horizontal axis and we have this vertical axis so if we expand this horizontal axis so we can see that it actually has different buttons it has the left key it has the right key it has the a key and it has the d key if we press on a it will move to the left. If we press on D, it will move to the right. So these are the default keys for moving. You can always change them. You can just go here and change it to something else. But these are the default ones because usually these are the keys to move the player left or right, okay? So then 
we're looking for any key that is the horizontal axis. So here we're simply checking each frame if the player is pressing on A or D or left or right. And the reason it says negative button or positive button and it says alternative negative button or alternative positive button is because if we press on right it will return the value of 1. If we press on left it will return the value of minus 1. And the same thing here. If we press on A, it will return the value of minus 1. If we press on D, it will return the value of 1. And we can see it. Because now if we stand in the middle, if we go to the right on the x-axis, you can see it's positive, right? And if we go to the left, it's negative. And the same way, if we go up on the vertical axis, if we go up, it's positive. If we go down, it's negative. So we're going to get one of these values, plus one or minus one, okay? And with this value, we can actually understand what is the direction the player is moving. And we can use this value to move our player. So here, we're simply taking minus one or one, and we're placing it in site change Dot x. So now change.x will be either minus 1, 0, or 1, okay? And then we're going to do the same thing with change y. Because if we go here, project settings, input manager, we want to get the vertical axis. So if we press on the down key, on the up key, on the S key, or the W key. So, vertical, okay, so now it will check if we're pressing on one of these keys and it will also take the value and place it inside change.y. So then it takes these two values and it stores them inside change. So for example here we're going to press on going right, then dx will be 1, right? But here, we're going to press on uh, going down or something. So the y will be minus 1. But it all happens very fast because it all happens every frame. So it just checks what is the key that is held right now. And it gets the exact value. Right? So then it takes this value and it goes here into change. And then we're simply adding this value to this transform, okay? So if the transform was 0, 0, 0, whenever we press, for example, on right, on the right key, then we're going to get x1, right? So it will take this transform position, the 0, 0, 0, and just add x1 to it, okay? That's what happens here. The change will be this, and the transform position will be this, but then we're multiplying it by speed. And speed, for example, will be 1. Then we're multiplied by 1, and then we're multiplying it by time delta time. And this is exactly the thing that I told you before, that it's so the frames will be consistent, right? So it doesn't matter how many frames you're running the game, it will all happen at the same time. So it's simply multiplying it by the delta time, okay? So then it will just increase the x position by one. So if we go here and we select the player and we change the speed to one, so we change it here to one and we play, then each time we're going to press on the right key, it will just increase it by one every second. You can see every second it increases by one. I'm just holding the key. Okay, so that's what's going on here. We're simply checking for a certain change. So whether it's a change in the X or whether it's a change on the Y. And if it's positive one, it will go or to the right or up. If it's 
negative one, it will go to the left or downwards, okay? But in order to actually call our method, we need to make sure that there is an input because otherwise this method will be called every frame because here we placed it and we said, okay, just call it every frame, reset it, then get the input and then just run it. So it will run it. Even if we don't have an input, it will run it. And we don't want this to happen. We want to run this code. We want to move the character only when we actually have some kind of input. So to do that, we're going to use a if statement. And the if statement is something that we use a lot in coding. So we're going to learn that. And the if statement is simply something that we can, is simply a condition that we can put to run some code. Okay. So we do it like that. We type in if, then we put these brackets and then we put these curly brackets. And then we place the code we want to run in the middle. And here inside these brackets, we put the condition. So if something happens, only then run this code. Otherwise, just ignore it and continue running this uh, block of code. Okay? So if this condition is actually true, if this condition actually happens, then run everything that is inside these brackets. If this is not true, then just skip it and you're not going to run this code. You're just going to continue here if there is something here. If not, then just don't do it. Okay? So what we want to put as a condition to move the character? We want to check if the change is actually changing, right? We want to see if there is actually some change because here we're putting it to zero and here we're waiting to get some kind of values. So all we need to do is say if change is not zero. And this thing here, this exclamation mark, is simply a way we can say is not, okay? So we can do this operator, the assignment, and we can say it's not equals, okay? So if change is not equals to zero, so if it's not zero, it means that it actually changed, right? It means that something changed it over here. So it means that there was some input. So when this code will run every frame, right? Because it's the update method, it will simply check if the change actually changed over here because here we're setting it to zero, right? Over here, we're simply saying right now you are zero. We created it zero, but we also setting it to zero over here on this line. And in this line, we're checking to see if it will actually change because here it can become one it can become a minus one and on this line it can become one on the y or minus one on the y okay So these are the values that can actually happen over here. So it's no longer zero because here each frame, each frame, it means it happens so fast, all of this code. It happens 30 or 60 or 100 times every second. So it happens very fast. One time after another, it just runs this code. So it becomes zero and then it checks if we're actually pressing some key. And if we're pressing some key, it means that we're actually changing the value. So it's not zero. So here we're checking if change is no longer zero, then move the character. And then it will run this code. 
and then the transform position will become the transform position plus the change. So if we changed it on the horizontal, it will move to the right or left. If we changed it on the vertical, it will go up or down and it will also multiply by speed. So if we change the speed, it will be faster or slower. Okay. But it will only move the player if there is actually some kind of input. So let's save it. Let's go back into the game. Let's change the speed to about 10. Let's run it. And now if I'm pressing the D key, it moves to the right. If I'm pressing the A key, it moves to the left. If I'm pressing the W key, it goes up. And if I'm pressing the S key, it goes down. So the position changes all of the time. Left, right, up, down. So we can now move our player. Okay. And that's the way we're simply changing the position of the transform of this game object. And we're changing it by getting the input from the horizontal axis, which can only be one or minus one or zero, of course. If we're not pressing anything, it will simply stay zero. Okay. If we're pressing something on the horizontal, so either the A key or the D key or left key or right key. So if we're pressing one of these, it will change the value. If we're pressing W, S, up or down, it will change this value. So if we press A or left, A or left will give us minus one. If we press on D or right, it will give us one positive one. And here, if we press on W or up, it will give us one. And if we press on S or down, it will give us minus one. So here, the Y will change and here the X will change. Okay. So it simply searches for an input and it does that every frame. So it happens very fast. So each frame, it looks for some kind of input. So that's why we can move and then move and then move and then change the position and change the direction very fast because the code runs even faster than that. And if there is no change, if we're just standing still, it means that change is zero because we didn't change it and it will come here and we'll see that it's zero. So it will ignore this code and it will not run this code. So it will just go here and end and then it will come back to the update method on the next frame. And it will of course happen very fast, but we'll run this method. It will call this method only when this condition is actually true. Okay. So that's the way we use the if statement. And there are a lot of ways we can use the if statement. We can also do something. If this happens, do this. And if something else happens, do something else. So we, there's a lot of ways we can use this if statement and we're going to use it a lot. So don't worry about that, but that's the way we can control doing something if something happens or if something is not happening, right? Because here we said, if it's not zero, so if it's not happening, then do this. And this is the way we are actually moving our player. There are more ways to move objects inside unity. We use the transform. So that's the most basic way. We can also change the position of the game object by moving its rigid body. Okay. But we still did not talk about rigid bodies. 
So when we're going to talk about rigid bodies and actually use them, then we're going to see how we can move it using the rigid body. So a rigid body is simply a component that we attach on our object if we want to use some kind of physics on him. So if, for example, we're creating a platform game and we want the player to jump and then fall down, or we want something to fall or roll or bounce, things like that. So we use a rigid body component on our object. So if we have, for example, a ball, we can put it on the ball and then the ball will do all kinds of things. So we can actually move the actual rigid body, but if we don't have a rigid body, we can move the transform. And in our example, we don't need a rigid body because there are no physics, right? There is no gravity. The player can't really fall because we're standing on the ground, right? It's a top-down game. We're looking at this player from top, so he's not really going to fall. He's just standing on the ground. So we don't need a rigid body. So this is the basic way to move objects. And the speed, we didn't change it inside the code, right? But because it's public, we can change it here in the inspector. We can also make it 100 and then it will be very fast. See? But if you don't want to change it in the inspector, you can change it here, right? And it's supposed to be a float, so we put an F. You can also change it actually here in the actual calculation. You can put 100 instead of the speed. But the problem is that this way it will be hard-coded. And hard-coded means that we set the code here and we can't change it. I mean, we can change it, but we have to go here and actually change it manually. But if it will be 100 here, we can't change it here. We can change it, but it won't change it, right? If we change it here to 100, it will simply change this variable. But we're not using it, right? We're not using the speed because we just put a straight value over here. So it will always be 100. So that's not a good way. We want to be able to change speed because maybe later on we are going to see that 100 is too fast. So instead of going into the script and actually changing it here, we can change it from the inspector. That's why it's good to always put variables because we can control them, right? And we can use the speed later on in the script if we want to do other things with it. So instead of writing 100 and then some other value, we can just put speed here, right? And it will know that it's this speed and it will know that it's this speed. Okay, so let's put it back to 10. Let's run it again. And now we can finally move our player. And remember, this is just the scene view. So this is the scene view of the game. But here in this little window or this big window, this is the actual game. So this is the way it will look inside the game. We're not going to see these lines, the axis. We're going to just see this, okay? And right now, he moves, but he just stays pointing towards the front of the screen. And it doesn't really look good, right? So in the next episode, we're going to learn how we can create animations for different objects. In Unity, okay? So the animations will involve less coding. It's something that we do in Unity itself, but there's some coding involved because we need to actually set where the animation will start and at what point. So we're going to place it inside the script after we actually created the animations, okay? So thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. 
it will help me a lot. It will also help you keep track of this series. And little by little, we are actually learning to code. And if you didn't understand something, so please type it in the comments. I will try to explain it even better. Let's just remove these things or we can just leave them for now so you can read them later and see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode, we finished our movement script, so now we can move our player. And in this episode, we're going to start learning about animations, because right now, although the player can move, it still looks weird, and with animations, we can make it look better. But before we dive in into the animations, I have something that I forgot to show you here in the script. So I told you that we have this vector three and we also have vector twos, right? So vector threes have X, Y, and Z, and we usually use them in 3D projects and vector twos have X and Y. So you may be wondering why did I use vector three over here if we didn't even use the Z, right? We changed the X and the Y and we used both of them to move our player. We didn't even use the Z. So why did I use vector three over here? And there's actually a reason. I didn't do it just because there is a reason. So the reason is that if I used a vector two, it would just give me an error, okay? And the problem is this part over here, because if we hover over this transform position, we can see that it's actually a vector tree. And it makes sense because the transform position of the player has these three values, zero, zero, zero. Or if we move the player, it has different values. Even if the Z is not used in this project, it's still stands at zero, right? So the transform position is a vector three. So here, when we try to change it by adding this change vector, if it was a vector two, it would just give us an error and we can see it. Let's change all these vectors into vector two. So over here, there will be no problem because we simply created the vector, then we set it to zero. So it doesn't matter if it looks like that, or if it looks like that, right? Because it's still zero. We just care about X and Y over here. So it doesn't give us an error. Also here, we check if it's not zero, but here it gives us this error because it says operator plus is ambiguous on operands of type vector three and vector two, because it says, well, you can't add a vector two onto a vector three, because the position is something like that, right? Zero, zero, zero. And then we're trying to add a vector two to it. So for example, we want to add one on the X axis. So this is how it would look like, right? The transform position is zero, zero, zero. And the vector two would be, for example, one and zero. Then, okay, we're going to add this one into the X. The Y will not be changed because it's zero. But what about the Z? Even if we're not changing it, we still need to notice it. It will just say, okay, what about the Z? It will just give us an error because we can't add. There's something missing here. Okay. And that's why we can't use a vector two over here. We have to make it a vector three even if we're not really using the third value, okay? So if you were wondering, that's the reason. So now we can start with the animations. In order to create an animation for any object in Unity, we simply need to select the object and go into our animation panel. So we don't have these panels yet because when we install Unity, they are hidden. So all we need to do is go to window animation, and we're going to add this animation panel and we're going to drag it and place it over here. I like this location. You can place it wherever you want. Then we're going to add another panel and it's this animator. Okay. 
and the animator appears here next to the scene. So there's another tab over here. So this animator panel, it's where we're going to create all of these connections of our animations to the object and set all of these transitions. When will it happen? How long will it happen? The animation panel is where we're going to actually create these animations, okay? So in order to create an animation in a 2D project, we are going to simply put a few different sprites together and that's what's going to create the animation. In 3D projects, it's a little bit more complicated. We actually move, for example, our legs and then we move the hands and we move all the parts that we want to animate and we say that this part will be at this position on this second then you move it a little bit to another position on another second of the timeline. So it's a bit uh, trickier, but we're not going to cover that because it's not a 3D project. In 2D projects, it's simply about using different variations of the sprite. So we have all of these here and the sprite sheet that we downloaded has different animations. So it has these walking animation, all kinds of uh, attacking animations. We can also download weapon animations in that website. But we can see that we have many different variations and it's all one animation, okay? So in order to start with the animation, we're going to simply select the object that we want to create an animation for. And we click here on create. So it says to begin animating player sprite. Create an animator and an animation clip. So when we click on create, it will ask us to select a folder to store all these animations. So we're going to simply create this folder. Animation. And then we're going to go back here, create and select this folder. Okay. And press open. So now we're going to give a name to this animation. And the first animation we want to create is the idle animation. So that will be the animation when the player is just standing still. And although he is not moving, we still want to create an animation for that because we want the player to be in some kind of animation at every point. Okay. So even if he's not moving, we still want him to be in this idle animation. And then when he starts moving, we can just change the animation to the moving animation. And you can also make the idle animation uh, special. For example, he can stand and blink or he can stand and breathe and his body will move a little bit. But we are only going to create a very simple idle animation, which will consist of one image because we don't have any kind of idle animation inside the sprite sheet. So we're going to call it idle player, player, and make sure that you can actually understand what this animation is for, because later on you don't want to go inside and check, okay, what is this animation? So if you put idle, also put player, so you know that it's connected to the player, okay? Save, and when we save, this timeline appears over here, and also this component appears on our player. So the animator component appeared on our player. Okay. So when we created our first clip, the animator appear and this will control all of these animations. So now we have this idle player animation selected over here and we need to create it. So we're going to go inside the art folder and we're going to find a simple sprite for the idle state. So usually if we just want the idle one, we can use the same exact sprite that we use over here. It doesn't have to be, but it's pretty logical to use this one because that's the one that we chose to just stand still. So we're going to use this one. I think it's somewhere over here. I think it's this one or this one. So we're simply going to drag it into our timeline and place it on the first slot over here. You can always change the way you see this timeline. You can go here and change it from seconds to 
frames okay so it means that this is 60 frames and it will run on 60 frames you don't have to fill this entire timeline it really depends on the kind of animation you want for example in 2d projects and especially with this pixel art style you never really get to a lot of frames because you can see they just gave us these nine variations of every animation so it means we can only have nine different frames so it won't be a full 60 frame animation if you had something else for example a fire or something like that and you want it to be very smooth and very animated then you can have maybe 60 different images and then place them on every frame and fill this entire timeline but because we only have nine of them we need to place them here accordingly okay so it will still look good because it's a pixel art a sprite and it will still look okay so we only are going to use this one frame for this animation so it's not going to be an animation it will be just the player standing still without any movement but we still want to create an animation for this so that's all we simply drag it here and that's it now we're going to create an animation for the player when he is walking to the left. So we're going to go here, create new clip, and we're going to call it idle, no, not idle, walk left player, okay? And save. And now we're going to drag all of these different variations of the walking, well, not this one, these ones we're going to drag them one by one and then we're going to preview how it looks so we can press on play here to preview so we're going to drag the first one on the first frame and we don't have to place them on each frame we can make some kind of spacing so for example the second one I will place on 5 then 10 15 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40. So we're only going to have 40 frames for this animation. And when we press on play, we can see that it actually looks pretty decent. Okay? And that's it. We created this animation. So now we're going to do the same thing with the other directions walk right player and always make sure that if you decided to have 40 frames for one direction then also make the other ones 40 frames otherwise it will just look weird and it won't be really in sync with one another right so you don't want to make one 40 frames and then the other one 60 frames and then the other one 15 frames we can also do something like that we can select all of them all the nine one two three four five six seven eight nine and just drag them over here and then we can simply move it the first one here second one here so it will be much faster we don't need to Drag them one by one. Okay, let's play. Okay, it looks good. There's some kind of movement with the legs, but it won't be perfect. You can always play with that. You can fix that by just putting maybe the first one over here again, and then removing it, and then maybe it will look a little bit better. There is all kinds of ways to fix it, but it's just about trying this sprite sheet and see how they created it. Because sometimes they create these sprite sheets in a weird way and you just need to play with the frame. So maybe you don't put the first one over here. Maybe you put the second one first and then the first one you put last. And sometimes it will fix the problem. But we're not going to deal with that. So now we have all of these four directions and we have the idle animation when he stands okay 
So now we simply created these animations. We did not attach them to the player. We did not set anything to happen at any point. So if we play the game, they will still not appear because we didn't really set them. So this is why we're going to use this animator. And when we created these animations on the player, so all of this appears because we selected the player. If we selected another object, it would show the animator of the other object, if he has an animator. Our player has an animator, right? Because it appeared here when we created these animations. So now all of these variations, walk left, walk right, appeared over here. And in this animator, we can do all kinds of transitions and connections in a visual way. Okay, so we don't have to use code over here. We're going to use code, but in this place, it's all visual and we can drag these things over here. But we're not going to use these ones. We can use them in a very simple way and it will work. But because we want to do it in a more efficient way, we're going to do something else. We're not going to use these ones. So let's delete them. So now when I'm deleting them, it's not really deleting the clips because if we go to the animation folder, we can still see these clips. So I'm simply deleting them from this view over here. Okay. And they're still here. We still have these animations, but we're going to do something else in order to make them work. So we can see that we have this entry and the idle player. So this is the animation when the player actually stands. Okay. We can see here idle player. And this arrow means that when we start the game, this is the first animation that the player will be at. Okay. But now there are no connections to other animations. So you will always be in this state. Okay. And to create a connection to other animations, we're going to create a blend tree. So we're going to right click, create state from new blend tree and a blend tree is a way we can connect different animations and make them work depending on different conditions. So for example, we want a tree that will focus on the walking. Then we're going to create another tree that will focus on uh, the sword swinging. Okay. So this way we can group different types of animations together. So we're going to click on this blend tree and we're going to change the name to walking tree. Okay. And then we're going to make a connection to this tree. So all we need to do is right click on idle player and select make transition. And this arrow will appear sticking to our cursor. So we're going to select left click and then we're going to do the same thing. Right click, make transition and put an arrow back into idle player. So these transition arrows will simply determine what is the condition for the player to go to this animation and then what is the condition that will happen for him to go back to this animation. Okay. So we still did not connect the walking animations over here, but we want some kind of condition to go over here. Okay. So when we click on one of these arrows, we can see this thing here and we can see conditions. So here we're going to put a condition that only if this condition is true or not true, then the player will no longer be in this animation and he will be in this animation. Okay. So the condition we want to put is a bool and we didn't learn about bools yet. We're going to learn about them more and more because we use them a lot in coding. So a bool or a boolean is simply a different kind of variable and it also stores some values. So floats store numbers with a decimal point. Integers store full numbers. Vectors store three different values. A bool can only store two values and the values can be only true or false. These are the two values that it can store. Think about it as zero and one. It can only store zero or one, but we are using true and false and that's it. So if I create a new bool, for example, 
private bool and I need to give it a name. So usually we call bools after the thing we want to track. If we want to track something, if it's true or false, we simply give it a name. So in our case, we want to track if the player is moving. So is moving and then we can say true. Okay. So that's the way we use these bulls. And then later on, we can change it to false. And that's it. It can only store these two values, false or true. Okay. And this way we can check if something is true or false. For example, a light switch, if it's on or off, if it's on, we can say true. If it's off, we can say false. And then there will be no problem. We don't need to check if it's one or zero, or if it's not uh, more than one, like with floats or integers, because here we can only store two values. Okay. And we're going to use these bools to set a condition. When will the player be in this walking animation? And when will he be in this idle animation? So we're going to create a bool, but we're going to do it visually over here inside the animator and not inside our script. We're going to set it inside our script, but we're going to create it in this animator. So all we need to do is go here to parameters and click on this little plus sign and then select bool. And we're going to give it a name. So we want to check if the player is walking or not. So we're going to call it is walking. Again, the name doesn't really matter. It's just for us to keep track of the bool. So now we created this is walking bool and we're going to click on this arrow that goes from idle to walking. You can see the arrow is pointing over there. So in the conditions, we're going to select plus and we're going to select is walking because it appears over here. So it knows we created it and we want to say if is walking is true, if the value of is walking is true, because it can only have two values, true or false. So if it's true, then actually move from idle to walking animation. And then we're going to do the other way around. We're going to select this arrow. We're going to add is walking, but we're going to say if it's false. Okay. So if it's false, go back to be idle. And that's it. And this way, when this bool will change, the actual animation of the player will change. Of course, we need to change it by ourselves in the script, but we're going to get to that later. For now, we want to also attach these walking animations into this blend tree. So we're going to double click on the tree and this space will appear. So here we need to attach all of these animations for the different directions. So we're going to click on this tree and we're going to select here in the blend type to the simple directional. I'm not going to cover all the other ones. If you ever need them, you can learn about them. I never use them. So I'm going to show you this one. And then we have the different motions. Okay. So we have this motion list, but now it's empty. And we also have these parameters. So we didn't learn about parameters and we're going to go into them later on. Parameters are simply values that we can pass onto a different block of code. So for example, we want to pass some kind of information inside this move character so we can place this information over here and then it will get it from within this method. Okay. So these are parameters. Of course, I'm going to explain it much better later on, but right here, we need to create two parameters that will help us decide when to activate these different animations, because what do we have here? We have four different animations and each animation is basically a different direction, right? So using this blend tree, we can activate them according to the direction we're actually walking. 
So we don't need to create more bools and then say, okay, if the player is walking to the left, uh, then is left, then if it's true, then activate this animation. If he's walking to the right, then set is right to true. We can do that. We can definitely do that, but it's really pointless because we can do it in a very simple way using this blend tree. So we're going to add these motions into this list. We're going to click on this plus add motion field and we're going to create four of them because we have four animations, right? The idle player we already have here, so we don't need to touch it. So we're going to add four different motions, but right now they're empty. And then we also have this screen that will help us visually see the direction. And then we're simply going to add all of these animations into these fields. So we can take them and actually drag them inside, or we can click on this thing here and then select them. So the first one will be walk left, walk right, walk down and walk up. Okay. So we have these four animations and we can also see them over here right now. But now what will be the condition for them to actually start running? And the condition is over here, these parameters. So we're going to use the direction of the player to activate these animations. So we already have this information over here, right? We have change X and change Y. And we used this input, we got one or minus one, and we stored it inside change X. And then we used it over here to actually move the player. So we can use the same exact data to set these animations. Okay. And that's the way the blend tree is working. So we need two different parameters, one of the X value and one of the Y value. And then we're going to connect them using the script. So we're going to go here and the same way we created this bool, we're going to create floats right? Because these parameters are floats and we want them to store the same kind of information. So we're going to make them floats. We're going to create a float, call it move X and move Y. Okay. So we're going to use these parameters to actually get this information. So over here in the parameters, we're going to select move X and move Y. Okay. And we're simply going to attach this information inside of them. And then it will go over here and we can set these different kinds of movement animations according to these parameters. So you remember, if we want to go to the left, we pressed on the left key or the A key, and it would give us the value of minus one on the X axis. If we want to go right, we press right or D and it will give us the value of one on the X axis. If we want to go up, it would give us the value of one on the Y axis. And if we want to go down, it will give us the value of minus one on the Y axis. So we're going to use the same values to control and set these animations. Okay. So over here, we need to set these animations according to these values. What do we need to activate the left animation? If we want to go left, we're simply going to use the same thing we used here, right? Minus one on the X axis. So we're going to place it here, minus one. And the Y should be zero because we're not moving on the Y axis. If we move to the left, we're not moving on the Y axis. And then what do we need when we move to the right? one on the X axis, right? You remember one on the X axis and then, and zero on the Y. And then what happens when we go down? Minus one on the Y axis. So on the X axis, it's zero on the Y axis, it's minus one. And to go up one on the Y axis. 
So one on the Y axis and zero on the X axis. And you can see that all of these little blue dots also appeared in this way. And now this blend tree simply says that if it will detect this value inside of X, inside of move X, it will activate this animation of the player walking to the left. If it will detect the value of one inside X, it will move to the right. It will set this animation, right? It will not move. We are going to move it over here, but it will set this animation. So as long as we're moving to the right, it will also set this animation. And when we move down, it will set this animation. When we move up, it will set this animation. And that's the way these blend trees work. But we also need to connect our script with this animator because it simply says, if you have these values, then run this animation. But we didn't send these values to the animator, right? Because these are parameters. We need to send this data to this animator from within the script, okay? So to do that, we're going to get the reference of the animator. And we didn't get references before, so we're going to learn about that. So to get a reference, we're simply going to find this component of the animator on our player, okay? The same way we got the reference of this transform when we wanted to move the player, right? Over here, we said transform position. So because this script is on the player, it means that if we say transform, we mean this transform. So we're simply getting this reference. And reference means the connection, right? The connection to this transform, to this component. And then we also set position, so it means that we went inside the position of the transform. So the same way we're going to get the connection or the reference to this animator component. And to do that, we're going to create a variable of this animator. So this thing here, unlike these two, unlike the float and the vector that are variables, the animator is a class. That's why it's in a different color. So it's a class that is built in inside Unity. And the same way we have this class player movement, animator is simply a different class that we can't see that is a part of Unity, okay? And it's also a component because we can see that it's a component that controls these animations. So we create this public animator and we're going to call it player animator. It doesn't matter again, it's just the name. So we need to make this connection so we know that this animator is this animator. Okay? And to do this connection, we're going to get the component. So we're going to do that inside the start method because we only want to get this connection, this reference at the beginning of the game. We don't want to do it every frame, right? It's pointless. We don't need to get this connection every frame 60 times a second. We only need to get it once at the beginning to set the connection. And when there's the connection, it will always be connected, right? When you plug in your USB cable, you don't need to do that 60 times a second, right? You only need to plug it once when you just want to create this connection. So we're going to do that in the start method at the beginning of the game. And we're going to say that this animator that we created is equals to get component animator. Okay, so the same way we store values from right to left inside variables, we're storing this connection into this variable because it's a variable. It is a component, but it's a variable of this component. Okay, this player animator. This is the type. So we're storing this connection into 
this variable. And the reason we say get component because we already know that this animator component is on our player. So we're simply getting this component and it's very easy. Get component, right? If we wanted to get a component from another object, then we should say other object get component. So get component from another object. But because we're referring to this object, the player, right? Because this script is on the player, we can simply say get component animator and then it will find this animator and it will get this component and get this connection. And then it will store this connection into this player animator variable. But we need to create it over here so that we actually have this variable because we can't do this, right? It says the name player animator does not exist in the current context. We need to create it, okay? So now that we have this connection, we can change and control this animator component from within the script. And we are doing the same thing with many different things inside Unity, and we're going to do it later on when we learn about more components. So we're going to set all of these variables, this Boolean and these parameters, we're going to set them inside the script using this reference, using this connection. So we're going to have to decide where do we want to change them? At what point, right? So we know that this Boolean that controls this thing here, this is walking, when it's true, we want to start the walking animation. When it's false, we want the player to be idle. So it means that we want to make it true, we want to make this Boolean true, this uh, walking boolean we want to make it true only when the player is actually moving so where is the player moving in the script over here right if change is not zero so if the change is not zero it means that we pressed on something it means that there is some kind of change so do this so we can do it inside this move character but we can also do it over here it doesn't matter it will still happen at the same time, almost at the same time, but it's very fast, so it's pretty much the same time, okay? If for some reason we wanted the animation to happen after or before or something like that, then we can consider placing it accordingly. But we don't care because it will all happen so fast, so we can place it here and we can place it here but we're going to place it inside the move character so it will be again visually more comfortable for us and because it actually is connected to this move character method so we're going to do this inside and we're simply going to use this reference player animator and there we're going to say set bool because we want to set the value of a certain bool inside the animator. That's why we have this little dot. So it's a bool that is inside this animator. And this animator is this animator. And the bool we have here is is walking. So we need to specify the name. So the name is is walking and make sure that it's the same way, okay? If you have a capital W, so make it the same way, otherwise it will not recognize this boolean. So now we have the name and we simply need to set the value. So what will be the value when the player is moving? True, right? If it's true, then start this animation. So we're going to say that when the player is moving, set it to true, okay? And then it will see, oh, okay, so the bool is now true. It means that I need to start this animation. All of these animations, right? Then it checks what is the direction, but it still needs to know that it's actually walking. 
So first it checks if it's even moving and only then it's deciding what is the direction. Okay, that's the thing about blend trees. And then we also need to say when will the is walking become false, right? When we want to go back into idle. So if this is the part that the player is moving, it means that we also need to find the area where the player is not moving. And that's why we're going to use the else statement. So the else statement is basically something that comes with if. And it means that if this is true, if this condition is met, then run this code. Else, it means everything else except of that, run this code. So we can't use else by itself. We have to use it after if. Okay, there's also a thing called else if, but we're going to learn about it later. So if change is not zero, it means that there is some movement, then run this code. Else, it means that if change is zero, right? Because if it's not, not zero, it is zero, okay? and then it will run this code. So here, we're going to place this thing, because over here, it will run it when the player is not moving, okay? So player movement, but this time we're going to set it to false, okay? So if there is some kind of movement, some kind of input, then run this code and then it will set it to true and the animation will be walking. Else, it means that there is no change, so the player did not put any input, then set it to false, okay? So now we are changing the value of this boolean is walking whenever we need to. So we don't want him to walk over here and we want him to walk over here. Not actually to move, but to just walk animation wise, right? And then we also need to set these two parameters, move X and move Y. So we're going to set them to actually figure out what is the direction the player is moving to set the according animation. So we're going to do that also over here because if the player is moving, then set it to true and then decide what is the direction. So we're going to do the same thing, player animator, but this time it will be set float because we want to set the float. So what is the name of the float? We have two of them. We have move X and move Y. So again, it has to be the same way, this lowercase m and then the uppercase X. So move X and what is the value we want to put inside? it's this value because here we're going to get one or minus one and it will go inside change X. So this is the value we're going to put inside. I mean, we can't go here and put a value like that because then it will always be one and we don't want it to always be one. We want it to change in real time according to the actual input. So we're going to place change X. And that's the beauty about variables that we don't need to put information by ourselves. We can just use these variables and they will do this for us. Okay, so the value of change X will go into move X. And the same thing we're going to do with move Y, but change Y, okay? So this information this value will go inside move X, this value will go inside move Y, and it will happen every frame because move character is called within the update method. So every frame 60 times a second or even more or less, but 60 times a second, it will check if there is some kind of input. If there is, it will run move character if the character is moving, then we also want to set the animation to be walking. And then we are also going to change the direction animation based on 
these values okay on these inputs and if the player is not moving then we're going to set it to false and that's it and that's the way we control these animations using this animator component and right now it should actually work okay because we have all of these connections we can go to the scene we can save of course don't forget to save your scene then when we play let's just go into this game window when we play there's actually this animation when we walk up it goes up when we walk down it goes down when he stands it's just idle but there is something weird i don't know if you're noticing it because you can't see my keyboard when i walk and then i release the key he is still walking for like half a second. There is some kind of delay between when I actually press the key and release the key, he is still walking a little bit. So there is some kind of delay that happens when this animation supposed to stop and when this animation supposed to start. And it's actually something we can change because right now it's not I want him to stop walking when I release the key, not half a second afterwards. So the way we're changing it is by going back into the animator. And when we click on these arrows, we can see this blue thing here and it says has exit time. Okay. So this is a way to control all of these transitions. And if we want some kind of delay between the, the different animations okay so we have different settings over here transition duration transition offset fixed duration exit time so we don't want any of them right now for all kinds of situations maybe you want to play with these settings but we don't want them so i'm going to untick this box i'm going to untick this box and i'm going to set this to zero and i'm going to do the same thing with the other arrow untick untick and zero and you can see that all of these blue things just disappeared, right? So now when I start and I play the animation, it will look much better. I'm pressing, I'm releasing, I'm pressing, I'm releasing, I'm pressing, I'm releasing, I'm pressing, I'm releasing. So it responds to the actual keys in real time and there is no delay. And now it looks very good and very nice and it feels good and now we have this character that actually walks there is some life into him and all of this coding and all of these stripes became something that actually lives and walks and that's the way we do animations of course there is much more to it we can also animate other things for example a campfire or some kind of uh, effect if we want to animate a tree that his leaves are just swinging around we can do a lot of different animations on different objects and of course we can also animate the player because we need to animate him in order to make it look good so in the next episode we're going to start adding some environment to this scene because right now we have this boring gray scene and we want it to actually be something okay we want to also develop this game although that's not the point of this tutorial and we're learning good coding and we're learning about unity we also want to see how we can do all of these things to create a simple game so we're going to learn that in the next episode thank you for watching please subscribe if you still have any questions regarding to the script or anything else you can ask me in the comment please leave a like if you like this video it will also help me a lot and see you next time hello there and welcome back in the previous episode we learned about animations we saw how we can use the animator to set different conditions that will determine when we run a certain animation and we also added these animations to our player so we can walk around and we can see that these animations appear when we walk around. 
In this episode, we're going to start creating our environment. So there are a lot of ways we can create environments and it really depends on the type of game. We can have huge open worlds and we can also have small levels. But in this game, we're going to do something very small and I'm going to show you the tools we usually use to create these environments. But before we get into the actual environment, we need to learn a few basic things and then I can actually show you the tool we use to create the environment. So the things that we need to learn, let me just write it down over here, is sorting layers, rigid body, colliders. So we need to learn these three things before I actually show you how we create the environment because then we're going to use all of them to interact with the environment. So first of all we have sorting layers and sorting layers are simply different layers that we can place our different sprites. For example if we have some grass here we don't want the grass to be on top of the player. We want the player to be on top of this grass, right? And then we have a tree or something. So we want the tree to be on top of the grass, but if the player passes underneath the tree, then it will appear like he's underneath the tree, right? So we need to have all these different layers to control which sprite will be on top of which sprite, right? And if we go here to the sprite render, we can see this sorting layer and the order in layer. So the sorting layers, first of all, when we install Unity, we only have this default, but we can create a lot of different layers. For example, we want the ground, so let's just call it ground. And again, it's just a name. It doesn't really know that it's the ground. We're going to set it to be the ground. But now we have this second layer. So for example, if I was to place the player on this ground layer and then I would place another object on the ground layer as well, then both of them would be on the same layer. And then you ask, okay, so which one would be on top of the other? Then comes and play this order in layer. So if the player will be zero and the other object will be one, it means that the other object will be on top of the player. And if there will be a third object that will be number two, then the number two will be on top of all the rest. And I'm going to show you it in a minute. But these are the sorting layers. But then we have these two different layers. And if we go inside, we can see that this layer, the ground layer, is created after the default layer. So it's underneath but actually it means that the ground layer is on top of the default layer, okay? So all the items that will be on the ground layer will actually appear on top of the items that are on the default layer. Let's see how it works. First of all, I imported this tile set that we're going to use in this project. So it's really the same principle like this uh, character sheet. It simply has different objects, all kinds of grass and uh, trees and tiles for the floor, houses. So you can find a lot of these all over the internet. So we're going to import it as a sprite 2D. We're going to select multiple because we have multiple items inside. And we're going to cut it to pixels per unit of 16 because that's the same way we did with our character and we want it to all be consistent and we're going to leave the rest as it is. We're going to apply and then inside, again, I can use the automatic slicer or slice everything right now, but I don't really need to do that because I don't want to use all of them right now. I just want to use a few of them so I can just come here and cut the ones that I want to use. So for example, I want to use this one. So I just left click and drag the mouse and it selects this one. And I also want to use, let's say, this one over here. Okay. 
So I have these two selected. And all I need to do is click on apply and now it will cut both of these into separate images. And now if I go out and I click on this arrow, we can see that we have this floor and we have this chest. Okay. So now I can drag this floor inside the scene and I can drag this chest inside the scene and it will basically be just two different sprites the same way our player was a sprite at the beginning, right? Because we can see they have this sprite render component and they simply have a different sprite inside of them. So I can take this floor sprite and I can just duplicate it by clicking on it and pressing on Control D. It will just duplicate this and then I can move the copy over here and then I can do it again and again and again okay and then I can choose all of these and duplicate them and move these ones here so this way I can actually create some kind of floor of course this is not the way we actually build scenes and backgrounds in Unity because it's not an efficient way and it's definitely not a fast way. You're not going to create hundreds and thousands copies of the same floor to just create some kind of a house, right? It's not efficient and it's very slow. So we're not going to do it this way, but I'm just giving you an example for the sorting layers. So let me also duplicate this one. So now we can see that all of these floor sprites are on this default layer and the order is zero. So the player will still be on top of them. And if I change it to default, he will still be on top of them. So if he walks over here, he will be on top of them. But if I take this chest, for example, and I move it over here, the player will also be on top of this chest, right? because they're all on the same layer, okay? So usually it takes the player and it places it above, but I'm going to show you how we can change that. So for example, we want the chest to be above the player. So we simply select the chest. Okay, let's rename it to chest. And here we're going to change the order in layer to one. So now this object will be higher than all the rest because he's on layer one and they are on layer zero in the default layer, okay? So now the chest will be above the player, okay? And this is simply the way it will appear, okay? There is no collision or something like that. If the player will walk, he will not bump into it or something because these are just sprites. There is nothing yet that will make it uh, solid, okay? This is just a way to show sprites in different layers and that's why we use these sorting layers okay the next thing we want to learn about is this rigid body okay and colliders we're going to learn about them together so if we want to make this item for example solid okay we want the player to just walk and that he won't be able to go over it he will just get stuck over here Okay, the way we do that usually in Unity is by using box colliders. And not only box colliders, but any type of collider. The box collider is simply a rectangular collider, and we have circle colliders, sphere colliders. It, it really depends on the type of collider you want to create. So, for example, we want to make this box solid, okay, and we don't want the player to walk through it. So we simply select this box. Oh, let's, let's just call it back chest because we were in play mode. So remember, if you enter play mode and you do some changes, then when you exit play mode, it will not save these changes. That's why it didn't save it. So the way we're going to add a box collider to this chest is by simply selecting this object and we're going to add a component and here we can see that there is a box collider but we can simply type in 
collider and it will show us a lot of different colliders. So a box collider will be square, a circle collider will be circle, and we can choose whatever we need. We are going to stick with box collider because it's the easier one to use and it fits the shape of this box, right? And of course we want the 2D version because this is a 2D project. So let's select this one. And now it will add this component to this game object, which is the chest, right? And we can move it around and we can see this green outline on the chest. So it means that this green outline is the actual box collider. We can always change this size. We can press on this thing here, edit collider, and then we can just drag and change the size of it. So usually we want the box collider to be the actual size of our object. Sometimes we want it to be bigger. Sometimes we want it to be smaller. It really depends on our need. Okay. And that's it. Now we have this box collider. But right now the player will still be able to pass through this chest. Because the player is still just a sprite. Right? The player doesn't have any box collider. And the player is just a piece of sprite. So when we run the game and we just pass through this box, it won't stop us. So in order to make our player an actual object inside the scene, actually have some kind of presence, let's call it, we're going to add a component that is called a rigid body. And a rigid body is a component we usually use on objects that we want to apply some kind of physics. Okay? So if we want a ball to just bounce or roll or fall or something like that, we use this rigid body. Because we can see that these sprites don't have a rigid body and they just appear over here. We can change the position but there is nothing going on with these ones. Also our player, he's just a sprite and we use the transform to move it all over the place. But now when I add a rigid body to this character, so we click on add component and we type in rigid body, we're going to use the 2D version again. Now we have a lot of options that are related to the physics of this object. Okay, so now if we run the game, look what happens. The player actually falls. Because in this area, it doesn't really know that we are creating a top-down game. It thinks that there is some kind of gravity, right, that will pull this object downwards. So to prevent this, we can go here to gravity scale inside the rigid body and just change it from 1 to 0. We can also put a different value to get different results. But if we want our object to just stay in place and not fall down, we simply put 0 and now when we play, it will stay in place. Of course, we can still move him because we're moving the transform. But now that we have this rigid body, it will be actually wiser to use this rigid body to move our player. Because it will be better when we want to do other stuff in the game. We don't want to move the transform because it will cause all kinds of problems and it will prevent us from doing different things. So if we already have this rigid body, we can use it to actually move our player and it will be better than using this transform, okay? So if we didn't need the player to stumble upon something, we could just leave it with the transform. But because we do want the player to not pass through walls or maybe later on fall or something like that, we are using this rigid body and because we're using this rigid body, we also want to use it to move our player. So it's very simple. We simply go into our script and over here we're going to use the rigid body instead of the transform. So in order to 
use this rigid body, we need to reference it the same way we did with this animator. So we're going to create a public rigid body 2D and we're going to call it rigid body. And then we're going to get the component the same way we did with the animator, but this time rigid body 2D. Okay. So now it will get the rigid body that is on this object. And this object is the player, right? And now we can use this rigid body over here. And inside the rigid body, there is a method that is called move position. So it says moves the rigid body to a position. And we need to provide it a vector. So we're going to press enter and we need to put some kind of vector into these parentheses. So this vector will be the position the rigid body will move. And we already have a position, right? This updated position. So instead of moving the transform to this position, we're going to move the rigid body to this position. And again, it will happen every frame. So we're going to take this, we're going to cut it and paste it inside. And now we don't need this anymore. So now we're going to move the rigid body that is on the player and it will actually move the player. Okay. So let's save it. And if we go inside, we can run the game and we can see that the player is actually moving. Although he moves a bit slower and that's just because the speed of the rigid body is slower than the transform and it also has something to do with the mass. Okay, because the rigid body now has a mass, we can also increase the mass, we can make it smaller, but we're not going to touch the mass. So if it's too slow for you, you can just increase the speed and he will move faster. Okay, now that we have this rigid body on our player, we still can't really interact with this chest because look, if we go here, we can still pass through this chest. So the last thing we need to do is also add a box collider to our player. So let's do this box collider 2D. And now we have a box collider on our player but we can see that it's way too big. So we're going to change the size. We're going to edit collider and we're going to change it to the size of the player. We can also make it a little bit smaller than the player. It really depends where we want to interact with other objects. Okay. So we don't want the hands to interact. We only want this part to interact. Okay. Something like that. So now if we play, we can actually see that it won't allow us to go into this chest, right? Because if I select this chest and I select this player, we can see that both of these box colliders just collide one with the other and it won't allow us. And look what happened. The player changed the position because the player is actually a rigid body. So all of the forces of physics apply to him and now he also floats and we don't want all of this to happen. So to prevent this, we're going into the player and we're going inside the rigid body. And here we have constraints. So we want to freeze the rotation. We don't want the player to rotate when he stumbles upon something. So we're going to freeze the rotation. And now if we walk to this corner, we won't rotate anymore. Okay. And now when the player walks, he won't be able to pass through this chest. He can still walk on this ground, on this uh, floor, but not on this chest. So now that we learned what are sorting layers and what are rigid bodies and box colliders, we can start with the tile map. And for that, we go into window 
2D and tile palette. And now we are going to see this panel and we're going to put it over here. And inside we need to create a new palette. So over here we're going to place different sprites that we want to use in order to paint our environment. So instead of creating these sprites and then just duplicating them and placing them one next to another and look what happens if I'm going closer there is actually some kind of space between them and I always need to go and find the exact spacing and it's really not ideal and of course it will take a lot of time to actually build something this way so we're not going to do it this way we're going to take all of them and just delete them and we're also going to delete this chest and now we want to create a new palette so to do that we're going to click here create new palette we're going to call it something main palette maybe and we're going to leave everything as it is, create. And now we need to select a folder for our palette. So we go into assets and we're going to create a new folder and we're going to call it tile palette. And we're going to select this folder, select folder. And now we need to drag a file or a sprite into this area over here because it says drag tile sprite or sprite texture over here so we're going to do that with this entire file so I'm going to just go inside the sprite editor and instead of copying these things here instead of slicing them I'm going to delete this one I'm going to delete this one and I'm going to slice everything here on two boxes of 16 by 16 okay so we go into slice grid by cell size and we're going to slice them by 16 and 16 okay and slice and now we can see that we have a lot of small squares and right now we can see that these squares are even smaller than the actual items that we want because this little cube here this little piece of floor is made out of four of these little cubes and that's fine because for example this table here we want to be able to paint all of it with these transparent parts that's why we're going to cut it to smaller pieces and then it will be easier to paint it on our scene but you're going to see what I mean so now that we have all of this sliced up we're going to press apply and it will take a while because we can see that we have a lot of these different small little squares so if you don't really want to use all of this for your environment or for the tile palette it's better to just create a smaller file and use only the actual images you want to use for the tile palette otherwise it will take you a lot of time for it to cut it and save these separate images but because that's the only file we're going to use in this project I'm going to do that so we press on apply and we're going to wait one minute or two okay so now it finally applied this slicing so we can go out and we can see that it sliced all of this image into small little squares but of course we did this to place it inside our tile palette because we are not going to really use them one by one and place them on our scene we're going to use them inside the tile palette so we simply take this entire file and we drag it over here and now when we release it it will ask us again to select a folder so we go back into the tile palette select folder and now it will take a while because you can see we have 1651 of these small little squares so it will actually create assets for each and every one of them so it will take a while that's why I told you if you have a big file and you're not really going to use all of this file 
it's better to just create a smaller version just to crop a small part of it and use that part in the tile palette otherwise it will create a lot of small images and then if you want to back up your project or copy it somewhere it would just take you longer because it will have much more files inside so we're going to meet when this ends okay so now that's done we can start using this palette so we can see that all of these images are now divided into these small squares and we can actually pick whatever square we want to use and paint it on to our scene okay but before we can actually do it we need to create this grid on our scene so we go here we right click to the object tile map and this grid will appear and inside we're going to see this tile map so the first time we create a tile map this grid will appear and we can see that our scene is now divided into these little squares and when we select our tile map we can simply choose this paintbrush choose a certain square and paint all over our scene so you see that this way it's much easier and faster to draw anything if it's this floor or other things of course we don't want these small things so let's just uh, erase them so let's select the eraser and just erase them and if for example we don't want to just paint one small square what if we want to paint all of this floor piece so we simply select the paintbrush and then we select all of these four squares and now we can paint this floor and see how easy it is we simply click and it created this floor and now we don't have many game objects for every piece of floor it's all inside this tile map okay and if we want to make it even faster we can delete this and select this tool over here and now we can simply drag and draw all of this so it's much faster we can just do it in a matter of seconds right so that's why this tile palette is much easier than just creating separate sprites and placing them together and it doesn't really make sense to do it after you know how to use this tile palette okay and for example let's make it just this size and now we can go and select something else we can select these fridges and place them here but notice something if for example I select this little plant here and I want to put it on the floor look what happens there is this transparent background and it will just cut through this floor so we don't want this and that's why we can simply create another tile map okay we click here on the grid to the object tile map and we can give them different names for example this one we're going to call a floor and this one we're going to call items or something like that and then we can simply say that floor and we go here to the render will be order in layer zero and the items tile map will be order in layer one so now all the things that we paint on this tile map will be on top of this tile map okay because if I'm going to paint it on the floor it will still cause this problem but if I'm going to paint it on the items tile map it will paint it on top of it okay so you always need to notice on which tile map you actually paint and you need to select the one you want to paint 
Another thing we can use is this thing here, focus on. So if we select tile map, so it will show us all the things that we painted on the floor. And then I'm going to select items. It will only show us in color the things that we painted on items. And this way we can see, okay, these are all the items tile map. And these ones are all the floor tile map. So we can use and create more tile maps depending on the layers that we want to create. And for example, we want to create walls. Okay, so let's just delete this. And if we want to delete something from one tile map, we need to select the tile map because if I'm going to select a different tile map and I want to delete this one, it won't allow me. So we need to select the appropriate tile map and then we can actually delete this. And let's also delete these plans. So we go to items. And now, for example, we want to create walls and we don't want the player to pass through these walls. So we're going to create another tile map and we're going to call it walls. And on this walls tile map, we're going to select, for example, this thing here. And then we can just paint it. like this and usually when they create these uh, special uh, sheets they always make them that we can do all kinds of uh, rotations and positions so we simply need to search for a piece that will go here for example this one and place it here and then continue with this one and select this one and then go and select this part here so simply need to search the part that you think should go here this thing here then we need to select this part here then we can create some kind of door for example something like that and then this part and then this part and then again we have the corner so we're going to select this part and this part and then this entire wall okay so now we have all of this on the walls tile map but we can also put it on a different sorting layer we can put it on number three or we can create a different sorting layer it doesn't matter the way we're actually going to make these walls so that the player won't be able to pass through them because right now if we play you can see that he can still walk past and they're actually above him but it doesn't matter he can pass through them so the way we're going to make them solid is by simply selecting this tile map and over here, when we go to this component, because each tile map is a separate game object. So if we want these walls to become solid, we simply select this game object, the walls, and we add a box collider. Actually, not a box collider, but a tile map collider, 2D. And now you can see that this entire part this entire tile map, the walls tile map, is filled with these green outlines. And it means that there's a box collider or simply a collider on top of these walls. So now if I play, I actually can't pass through these walls. Okay. And of course we can also zero and let's put the player on one because you can see this part here. Okay, so now the player can't move and can't pass through these walls. And then 
If we want to create other objects that the player can't pass through, we simply need to draw them on this tile map. So we go here to tile palette and we select, for example, this uh, fridge. Okay, but we only want this part. And also let's uh, change it to, let's change the floor to be in a different uh, layer because we played a bit with it. So the walls were zero, the walls will be one, the player will be two. And we can also create a different sorting layer, but I don't want to add something else. So we're just going to play with these numbers. So the player will be number two, walls will be number one, and the floor will be zero. Okay, and now we can paint this fridge over here and well, we don't want it to be on the floor, so let's select the walls tile map, and now we can paint the fridge. And if we play, we can see that the player can't move through this fridge because it also has this collider because it's a part of the walls tile map. And this is a small level. You can use this to create a big environment. You can use it to paint these bushes and these trees and these stumps and rocks. And you can place the grass to be on the first layer and then these trees on a third layer and the player on a second layer. And then the player will be underneath these trees. And there's a lot of things you can do. But this is just a simple way, and of course we're going to use this as we create our game. But this is the way we create these environments, instead of just taking these separate sprites and placing them one next to each other and creating some kind of ground, right? It will take us a lot of time. So with this thing, we can just paint it all over the scene. And then we can also delete this because we don't need this. So if we want to delete these things, we need to select the walls. And of course, if we wanted to create these fridges, I don't think that walls would be good. We can create another tile map and just call it uh, solid items or something like that. And then we know that we have a separate tile map for walls. We have a separate tile map for uh, solid items, so everything will be organized and there will be no confusion, right? So let's just delete this because we don't want the walls and let's just leave this ground for now, okay? So you can always come back and use this tile palette. You can continue and work on your scene, you can go back to the game, you can uh, do whatever you want, but when you want to paint something, you can just go back to the grid and paint whatever you want. Of course, you need to understand that some items, we don't want to paint them. For example, if we do want something to appear over here that the player will actually interact with, we are not going to paint it as part of this tile map. For example, if we want the player to open this chest. So in that case, we really need to go inside this tile set and go to Sprite Editor and select only this chest and then press apply and it will take some time and then this chest will appear over here and then we can drag it into our scene and we can actually use it as a separate game object and we can place all kinds of scripts on this game objects and this way we can actually interact with this game object. So all the things that you just want to paint, for example, the ground or bushes or everything that won't really be interactable, you can do that inside this tile map. But the things that you do want to interact with you need to actually create these separate game objects and then you will be able to interact with them. Okay, so just notice the difference. 
So I think that that's all for this episode. I just showed you the way we do this and we're going to use that later on when we develop this level. So this game won't be some kind of open world because it's really a simple game that I just want you to see how we create simple things in Unity and it's really for beginners so you're not going to get lost in some kind of huge game that we will never finish, right? So we're going to create small levels and we're going to be able to enter these levels through a main menu and then when we actually finish a level we're going to get some score and then we can go back to this level or we can unlock a different level so it will be this kind of game and you can see how we can go from one level to another level how we can create a menu and we're going to learn all of that in this series of course for different kinds of games you need to find other kinds of tutorials but the point of this tutorial is to learn the basics of Unity, so the game is not really important right now. But it's going to be a cool game. It will be some kind of game with mazes, and then you need to finish the maze as fast as possible, and there will be all kinds of obstacles and all kinds of puzzles. And I think that it will be cool, even if it's just for an example to show you how to use Unity in a very basic way as an absolute beginner, right? So thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. It will help me a lot. It will also help you to keep track of these episodes. Also leave a like if you enjoyed this episode and see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode, we learn how we can use the tile map to paint different kinds of sprites onto our scene and this way we can easily and very efficiently paint whatever we want and create different kinds of environments. In this episode we're going to start creating the layout of our first level and we're also going to create a few other scenes that eventually will all be connected and then we can just skip from one scene to another. So many Unity tutorials wait until later in the series to teach about scenes, but I don't think that it's something that we should wait with. I think we should create these scenes right now and learn how we can move between these scenes. So before we create other scenes, we're going to build the layout of our first level. So if we go here into the scenes folder, we can see that we have this sample scene and we can also see this name over here. So it means that all of this scene is actually this one scene. And we use different scenes in Unity to separate different locations, for example, or different menus in games. So if you have a big open world environment, maybe it will all be in one scene. But if you want to take performance into consideration, maybe it will be wiser to divide this entire open world into separate scenes and make it like that, that when the player passes a certain area, it will load another scene. In this way, there won't be a lot of game objects in one scene, okay? But of course, other games have separate levels. So in that case, you will definitely put each scene for a new level, okay? And then we have the main menu, which will be a separate scene, and then we also have the selection menu that will be a different scene. So this way we can go from one scene to another instead of just creating everything in one place. Because you're not going to create the game over here and then just go here and create another level and just teleport the player from this place to this place. Theoretically, you can do it, but that's not the way we do it. We create different scenes and then we just move from one scene to another. So because this scene will be our first level, we're simply going to rename it over here and we're going to call it level one. And now we can see over here level one. Okay, so we know that this scene will be level one. 
and after we finish with the layout we're going to create the main menu and we're also going to create the selection scene okay so we're going to have the screen where the player can actually go to options or exit the game or enter into the selection scene and then we're also going to have the selection screen where the player can actually choose the level he wants to play and then when we enter into a level it will actually load one of these scenes so you can use these scenes in different ways it really depends on your game maybe in your game you will have some kind of house so when you go into that house it will simply load another scene and the scene will simply consist the interior of that house so you can do whatever you want but i'm just showing you the basic way we use these scenes so in order to create some kind of layout and again i'm not going to finish this level right now i'm simply going to create some kind of layout later on we still need to add things into the scene objects we need to put all kinds of uh, variables that will store all kinds of information so there's a lot of things we still need to do in this level but before we create other scenes i just want to create the basic layout of this level and to do this i'm going to use an image to use it as a reference so inside the art folder i just imported this image of a maze okay it's a maze that i found somewhere and i'm going to use it just so i'll be able to build our level according to this map so you can create your own levels you don't have to use any reference i just think it will be faster to do it this way and later on maybe we're going to have more complicated mazes so instead of just building our own mazes we can use this one so it will take less time so then after we have it in our art folder i'm going to drag it into our scene right now it's very small so i'm going to just drag it and make it bigger and we need to decide what will be the size of our level okay so we want to create our level according to this image we're not going to use this image as a background we're only using it to get some kind of reference to the size and to the walls themselves okay so in order to make it uh, more easy for us we're going to delete these floors okay so we go to this tile map that is called floor we go to the tile palette we select the eraser we select a few more cubes so the eraser will be bigger and then we just erase these floors so now it will be easier to see this image behind us and now we need to decide what will be the size of this level because right now this is our player okay so we can make this level huge and the player to be this size or we can just change the size of this image maybe something like that i think this could be a good size okay something like that so now we have this size here and what we're going to do is simply paint over this image to create ourselves this level okay again it's something i'm doing so it will be easier we definitely don't need to do it every time we create a level i don't think other people do it this way it's just something that i thought will be very easy for us to do so now i go into this grid and i go into these tile maps so i can delete them again but i can also use these ones we have the floor we have the walls and we set the walls to be with a tile map collider so we know that the walls will be collidable so we can just paint on this tile map and before we paint the floor we can start with the walls so let's select some kind of sprite that will be the walls maybe we can use the same tiles we used in the previous episode so i'm going to select this thing here going to do it this way and you can see it also fits this image 
so we are lucky okay so i'm just going to paint it here and then i'm going to take this part paint it like that then i'm going to take this part and again it doesn't have to be exactly the same way i'm just using it as a reference okay so this way you can also, if you're creating a game with a maze, you can sketch your own maze on a paper and then just take a picture of it with your phone and import it into Unity and then use it as a reference so you don't have to build this from scratch. So let's just, of course, we can drag it. And over here we need to find something that will, for example, let's see this part here okay so we created some very basic layout of a maze and now we have all of this on our wall style map, so everything is collidable. The next thing we want to do is just paint the floors. So I'm going to do the same thing with the floor. So I'm going to this tile map that is called floors, and I'm going to select something, maybe this one. Okay. And this time I don't need to spend too much time. I can just do it like that. And we'll fill this entire area okay and now that all of this is done we don't need this reference anymore so we can just delete this image behind the tile map and now if we select none and we go back into our game we select the player we can see that we have our level over here so we still have some little cuts here and we're going to take care of that later on but if we play the game right now we can see that we have this maze that the player can walk in right now but we have a little problem and the problem is that the camera just stands in one place so if the player goes out of the view of this camera we can't see the player anymore so what we can do we can create a script for the camera to follow the player and maybe in a different episode I'm going to show you how to do that but a simple way we can fix it for now is just to take the camera drag it into the player and make it a child of the player and now let's also do it outside of play mode let's just drag the camera into the player and now because the camera is a child of the player it will actually move with the player so the position of the camera will move with the player okay so now if we play you can see that the camera actually moves with the player later on we're going to create a script and there's other ways we can make the camera move with the player but this will do for now so in this game we're going to do it this way that the player spawns at this point then he will have this entire maze and he will have to reach the end of this maze and he will have to do it as fast as he can but the problem is that there will be all kinds of different obstacles and maybe different puzzles that he needs to solve in order to get to this point okay but this will be the basic layout of our level so later on we're going to add more things here more interactable stuff we also need to actually set him to appear here and then when he reaches here the level will be done and we're going to deal with all of that later on but i just wanted to create this layout for now and now that we have this layout for our first level we're going to create more scenes so to do that we we'll simply go into our scenes folder and here we right click create scene and this one we're going to call main menu okay so now if we want to start working on this scene we simply need to double click on it so now 
we are inside the main menu scene and we can see it because it says over here and if we click on level one it will change to level one and we can see all the other objects that we had in level one but if we switch to main menu all of these things will disappear and only the main camera will appear and that's fine because in the main menu we don't really need the player right we're not going to use him we're not going to show him we're simply going to have a few buttons and maybe a title maybe a background and when we click on these buttons it will move us to another scene if we did want to use the character in a different scene then all we had to do is take this player for example and make a prefab out of him so a prefab is simply something that is stored inside our folders and we can use it in other scenes because right now this player only exists in this scene and if we go to the main menu he doesn't exist we can't even find him inside our folders so we can simply go over here and create a folder that is called prefabs and then we can take the player and drag him into this folder and now we can see that we have a copy of this player inside this folder and all the other components we had on the player also stay the way they were okay and now if we go and move to the main menu scene of course we need to save it first if we go to the main menu scene now we can find the player inside this prefab folder because all of these folders are part of this entire project and we can take this player prefab and drag him into the main menu and now we have him in the main menu and also in the level one okay so usually in the main menu we have a few buttons that when clicking on them move us to a different scene for example to some kind of level selection scene and over there we can choose a different level or for example we can select options and then move to the option screen or we can exit the game so we're going to do all of that in the main menu and then we're also going to create another scene that will be the level selection scene and in that scene we're going to actually be able to select the level we want to play in so let's make it simple for now later on we're going to focus more on the art we're going to make it look better for now we just want to put the basic elements and the thing we're going to use to create this main menu scene and to create these visual elements we're going to use the ui so the UI is something that is used to display things to the user and the user can also interact with these things and he can click for example or input things or just get the information. So if for example we placed the UI over here it would be on top of all of the other objects that we have in the scene so we use ui for example to display a health bar or maybe if we want to display some score so all the things that we want to display on the screen that are not actually inside the scene so in order to start with the ui we simply right click and we go to ui and we have all kinds of ui elements so the first thing we need to have is the canvas but we don't really have to create it because when we create another element it will automatically create the canvas for us so first of all we want to create a button so if i click on button it will automatically create this canvas and will simply place the button to be a child of this canvas so all of our ui elements are going to be children of the canvas and the canvas will appear as this big white rectangular and to actually view it we need to zoom out using the mouse wheel 
So this is our camera, right? This is our scene. But this is the actual canvas, okay? So that's the way it works in Unity. It's this big rectangle with these uh, white outlines. And inside of it, as a child, we have this button element. And we can use it, and we have all these guidelines that help us position it correctly. And when we move this button, we can also see the way it will look in our scene, okay? So for example, if we place the button over here in the middle, it will be in the middle of the scene. But if we move and increase the size of our game panel, we can see that the button actually looks smaller. And that's because it's all about the ratio. So the screen, the canvas is actually not resizing with the screen. So in order to do that over here in the canvas scalar component, we're going to go to UI scale mode and we're going to change it to scale with screen size. Okay. So we click on this and now the button will be the actual size according to this canvas. Okay. So then even if we move and make this screen bigger, it will stretch according to the size, according to the ratio, right? And that's the way we want it. So now we position this button in the middle of the screen. And of course we can also change its size. So we simply go here and we can increase its size, position it, and then we can also duplicate it. So I click on this button, control D, and now we have another button and I can move this one here. So just notice how these elements are organized. Both of them are children of the canvas. So now if we want to create another text over here for the title, for example, we're not going to place them inside the button because the text is not really related to these buttons. The text will be related to this entire canvas. So we're going to make it a child of this canvas, right click, UI text and now we have created this text so we need to position it we can also move it around and maybe we want to place it somewhere here okay and the next thing we want to do is also add a background so we can use this background that appears behind the camera, right? We can click on the camera and we can change the color of the background, but we don't want to do it because we maybe want to put an image or something like that. So the other thing we want to create, we right click UI and we create an image. And then we can drag this image to fill the entire view, actually the entire canvas. But look what happens now this image covers all the other elements and that's because it's over here under the canvas so if we want it to be behind the other elements we should put it to be first underneath the canvas so when it's the first child it will be actually behind the other things so i'm going to provide a link for a package that we can use for free and this package contains a few different ui elements of course, in your game, you can use whatever UI elements you want. So we're going to use this CGA UI gold pack. And inside we can find many different UI elements, all kinds of buttons, arrows, panels, coins. And we can play with them and create a very basic uh, UI. So you can also use it. I provided a link for it in the description. So the way we use them, because these are simply sprites, right? So the way we use them, we need to put them and attach them onto these elements. So for example, we have this first button. Over here, we can see the source image. So in the beginning, when we just created, there is this default UI sprite, right? It's this white sprite. So 
to change it, we simply need to drag one of them. Let's choose this one. We simply need to drag it into the source image and it will change the button over here. Let's do the same thing with the second button. And we can also change the color of the background because we have this image, so we can change it over here, right? We can change the color to what we want. But if we want to put some kind of picture, I'm going to use this background. So we drag it into the source image and it will change the background into this gradient green thing. Okay. And of course the text, we can also change it and stylize it. So we click on text and here we have different options. We can change the font size. See, as I drag it, we can change the actual box and then we are going to have more room. So we can increase the font. We can change the alignment so we can choose it to appear in the middle of this box or on the right side or on the left side. We can also change the way it will appear on top of this box or in the middle. So I'm going to put it on the center and also here at the center. So it will be on the actual center of this box. And we can also change the color over here. So I'm going to change it to something more orange. And again, we're not going to focus on this too much. Later on, I'm going to change it to something. And we're going to give it a name. So let's just call it our first game. Later on, I'm going to think about a name. And we can also, so sometimes when we use these text boxes, we are going to actually put the text over here in the inspector. But other times we're not going to put any text over here and we're going to change this text using a script. Okay. So for example, when we want to display some kind of score on the screen, we're not going to go here and change it because we can't do it when the game runs. So we're going to use the script to change this text that appears as part of this UI. Right. So sometimes we don't know the size of the text. For example, we have some kind of mission and then there's a description for the mission. So sometimes there will be like a short text and other times the text will be very long. So we don't want to set a font that will be hard coded. And then what if this text will be much longer? Right. If we're going to change it using the script to something very long, look, we don't actually see the text because the font is very big. That's why there is something handy that is called best fit. And if we click on best fit, we can put two different sizes. We can put a minimum value and a maximum value. So it will calculate the best size according to the amount of text we have. Okay. So it will go between 10 and 40. And then if we write something else, it will just make it smaller. Okay. If it doesn't have enough room, it will make it even smaller. So that's the good thing about this best fit, but because it's the title and we're not going to ever change it using the script, because there is no reason to change the title using the script, we're simply going to leave it at 40 and we're going to disable this best fit because there is no reason to use it. And then we also want to change the names of these buttons. Well, actually not the names, but the text on these buttons. So we go here and we click on the button and here we can see that there's actually a text element that is a child of this button. And we can see this text element over here. It just says button. So we can delete it or we can simply use it to give a name to our button. Start new game or maybe continue. And the second button we're going to change to options. Okay. Then we can also do the same thing with this text. We can 
make it bigger. Let's put it on maybe 24, make it bold. Same thing here, 24, make it bold. So we can do the same thing as we did with this text. I just want to change this text to maybe even bigger or maybe make it bold. Okay. So that's the very basic way we use these UIs. Of course, there's many more other types of elements. So text, image, and button are the common one that we always use. The other ones are very specific for specific uses. The other thing that we want to do is to keep our UI actually organized. Because right now it says button, button one, text, text, text. So we don't really know what the difference is between this text and these two texts. So that's why we can always change the names of the actual UI elements. So not the name that will appear here, but the name of the element itself. So the first button, we're going to rename it to continue button, right? This button, we're going to rename it to options button. This text, we're going to change to game title. You can also drag it here so it will be on top, although it doesn't really matter, but it's better for us. And this one, we're going to change to background. Okay, so this way, everything is organized. And later on, when we want to actually change these things using our script, it will be easier to find these different elements inside our script. Okay. So as I told you later on, I'm going to change it and change the colors a bit because that's not a good look for us. And we also need to change the actual functionality because right now, even if we play, we can't really click on it. It's a button, but nothing happens when we click on it. So that's because we did not attach any script to it and we didn't say anything to happen when we click on these buttons, right? So we also need to do that later, but for now we just wanted to create this scene, okay? The next thing we're going to do is create another scene. So go here, create scene, and we're going to call it level selection. We're going to open up level selection. We're going to do the same thing with the background. So image, and it created this canvas for us, we're going to drag it over here and we're going to put this background as the source image. And of course, we want to go to canvas and change it over here to scale with screen size, because look what happens. If we leave it as it is, constant pixel size, it may look fine over here, but if we actually drag this and increase the game size, we are going to see the background. And if we maximize on play and run the game, it will lose the size, right? We're still going to see this entire game screen and the canvas will be small. So that's why we want to scale the canvas with the screen size. Okay. And when we do it, we still need to just adjust it a bit. And now even if we play it on maximum, it will still cover the entire screen. Okay. So now we're going to change this also to background. And I'm going to create a small little panel over here that will be the first level. And when the player wants to start playing the first level, he will be able to click on this thing and he will be able to see all kinds of information. I just want you to keep track of everything I'm doing and actually make sure that you understand what I do.
Okay, so I hope you understood what I did here. And I'm still going to explain all of that in case you didn't understand something. So what I did here, I simply created this background for our entire scene. And then I created this panel, okay? So this panel is something that we're going to actually duplicate and make more of it for the different levels. But all of this has to do with this one level, okay? And that's why all the other elements are children of this panel. And this way, it's much easier to work. So all of these things are connected to this one panel, right? So we place them as children inside this panel. Then we have the level name. Then we also have these stars that are empty right now. And we have this start button. And we have this score background, this orange score we can also maybe here. And then we have this text, but the text is a child of this background because it will always be connected to this background, right? So we can make it a child and it will be easier to work this way. So there is this kind of logic inside the UI. You always want to make these elements children to the things that they're connected to, right? And that's just a good practice. It's just a good way to be organized. And it will also help us later on in the code when we actually want to connect all of these elements because we're going to connect this button so when we press on this button it will start the game we're going to connect this text over here because it's not going to show us score thousand right we're going to change this number to something else depending on our score so we're going to connect this text inside our script and we're also going to connect these stars and make them actually visible or actually colored if we got these stars, if we achieved a certain score. And this level will stay one, but we're going to change it depending on the level. So that's what I did here. It's nothing complicated and that's the way with the UI. In the beginning, it may look a bit uh, scary, but when you understand that it's really just elements that you put together and you place them one on top of the other, it's very simple. So the more you practice building UIs, the easier it gets. And of course, we don't want only one thing to be here. So it's very easy. We simply select this entire panel, control D to duplicate, and we're going to get another panel. And we don't need to create it all over again. We just need to change the level name and do all these connections inside the script. Okay, so now we have this panel, and as I told you, we still need to create all of this functionality using our scripts, but we already have these three scenes. We have the main menu, so the player will start here, he will be able to continue or start a new game, and he will be able to go to options, maybe we can also add an exit button, let's just leave it this way. So now we have this, then when we click on this button, it will go to level select. And here the player needs to select a level. So let's just take this thing here, this panel, let's duplicate it, let's move it here. And then we can change the actual name of the panel. So this one will be level one. This one will be level two. And here we can also change the text to number two. But here we can change the actual text of the button to say locked. Okay. So the player has to first finish this game and only then this button, this level will be unlocked. Okay. So we can also put a small icon of this little lock over here or something like that. We can do whatever we want. We can also make this button gray and this entire UI gray. So I can play with the colors. I can play with these things in some kind of photo editor and change 
the color to gray so it will be something we can use to make this gray until we actually unlock it so i'm going to think about the way we're going to do it but right now we have these layouts of these scenes and in the next episode we're going to start adding functionality using the scripts and of course we also need to start adding things to the actual game but maybe it's better to first finish with these things and then actually focus on the levels because the levels are the more complicated ones and we need to put more time into them so we can first finish these menus and then start with the levels. So I hope you understood everything. Again, I'm showing you just one example, but the way you're actually going to learn is by creating more and more UIs. Just open up a new project, play around with these UI elements, see how they fit, see how you can customize them and change the different settings, the different positions, create different scenes. Of course, I still need to show you how we can go from one scene to another, how we can make it to happen when we click on these buttons. But still, the way to learn is actually spend more and more time and just repeating these things and then it will be very easy and you'll get very comfortable doing it. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. If you're still not subscribed, please subscribe. It will help me a lot. It will also help you to keep track of this series. Also leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. It will also help me a lot. And I'll see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode, we created a few more scenes to our game. So now we have this main menu scene and we have the level selection scene. If we go to the main menu, we can see that it looks a bit different, but I haven't changed much. All I did was change the background image to this orange image, and I changed the title and gave it a name to Virus Escape. So this will be the name of our game, and I made it a bit bigger. So before we continue with this episode, I just wanted to change a few things in the main menu. One of those things is changing the font of our title. So if we want to change a font, we first need to import it into our project. So we're going to create a new folder and we're going to call it fonts. And here we're going to store all of our fonts. So you need to go and search for the font that you want. You can go to Google fonts, you can search any other website. And when you find your font, you need to make sure that it's a true type font file. Okay. So I downloaded a font and I dragged it into the fonts folder and it's this Londrina font. Okay. So to use it, all we need to do is go to the text we want to change. And then we go to font and instead of Arial, we're going to choose the font Londrina. Okay. And now you can see that the font changed. We can make it a little bit bigger now. And I think it will be good for now. Okay. Another thing I want to add is some kind of little decoration for the menu. So I imported this mask sprite. Okay. And all I'm going to do is create an image inside the UI. And I'm going to drag this mask onto this image and then I'm going to drag it a bit and I'm going to place it somewhere. Okay. So now it looks a bit better and there's more color. There's actually something that is related to the topic and you can do a lot of things. And this part is really about just sitting and building the art side of your game so you don't have to be an artist i'm not an artist but you want your game to look good so if you're not good at all with designing you can find a friend that is good and maybe he can help you or you can simply go and find some ideas online so of course we can also add things that move we can put some animation something that floats in the background maybe later on we're going to do something like that for now we're just going to leave it this way. So now we can also go to 
the level selection scene, of course save, and we can see that we have this background here as well. So what do we want to do in this episode? In this episode, we're going to focus on loading different scenes. So first of all, we want the main menu to be the first scene that loads when we start the game, okay? Over here in the editor, it doesn't matter if we're going to start this scene, it will start this scene. But when we actually build the game, there will be a scene that will load first. We need to go to File and Build Settings. And here we can configure all kinds of things that are related to the build of our project. And the build of the project is when we finally finish the project and we want to make it an actual file that people can download and install. So all of these settings are over here. We can also go to player settings and over here we can change the icon of our game and a different cursor. So there's a lot of settings we can play around with. But right now we want to focus on this thing over here, scenes and build. So when you just start your project, all of your scenes will not appear over here, okay? You will probably only have the first default scene, which is level one. I called it level one, but it was the first scene. So the rest of the scenes will not appear over here. So you need to actually come and drag them manually into this place. And then the way it works is that the scene that appears at the top of this list is the scene that will be loaded first. So we want the main menu to be loaded first of all. So we drag it on top and the rest we don't care because we're going to go to these scenes using buttons and such, right? So the important part is that the main menu is the first on the list. And now when we're going to run the game, the main menu will run first. So what do we want to do here? We want to click on this button and load a different scene, which is this level selection scene, right? So to do that, we need to use some kind of code to say that when we click on this button, on this UI element, load this scene. So there's a few ways we can do it. We can do it simply by using the code and then attaching this component to the script and finding the reference and then saying, okay, when you click on this component, uh, run some kind of code and the code will be to load this scene. But there's also a very easy way we can do it using the inspector. And because this thing here is a UI element, we get this button component. And over here we have this onClick function. So the onClick function actually lets us select the method we want to run when we click on this button. So we don't really have to do it inside the script, we can just do it over here. Although we do need to create the method we want to run. So first of all it searches for an object with a script and then it will search for a method inside this script. So let's create that script and we can just create something very simple and call it continue button. We can just call it continue button and we're going to attach it to the continue button element. Okay. So if we scroll, we can see it over here, continue button script. And now let's open this script. And all we need to do in this script is to create a method that we're going to attach to this button. Okay. So let's just create a method public void and let's call it load selection screen. Okay. So all we need to do in order to load a scene is type in scene manager, but right now it's not going to find this functionality because we need to add a namespace and a namespace is basically some kind of library that contains a lot of classes. 
So we learned that all of these objects that we have are basically classes. So if we want to use the class that deals with the scene manager or basically the scene manager class, then we need to use something that is called unity engine dot scene management. So this namespace contains this class. And now when we are actually specifying that we're using it, we can actually use it over here and it will recognize this class. And now we can say scene manager dot load scene. And it simply means that this is a method inside scene manager. And what we want to run, which scene, and here we simply need to say what is the scene. We need to type in the name of the scene we want to run. Okay. So let's save it. And the scene we want to run is selection screen, right? So level selection. Load selection, level selection. That's the name of the level selection. So the name of the scene is level selection, right? Because over here, it's called level selection. And we need to write it down the exact way it is spelled over here. So let's just copy the name, go into the script and paste it over here. And we're saying that this is a name, right? This is the name of the scene. It's not some kind of variable. Because if we want to use some kind of variable, we just leave it like that. But there is no variable right now. We simply want to specify the name of the scene, okay? And now when we're going to call this method, it will simply load a scene called level selection, okay? And now we're going to save. And we can click on this element on the button element and over here we need to provide an object that has a script and inside that script there is a function we can use so the object that has the script is the actual button itself so we can drag this continue button over here and now we simply need to search for this method so over here we go into continue button and over here, we need to find load level selection. So this is the method that we created. And that's it. And basically means that when you click on this element, go to this script and run this code. Okay. So now when we're going to click on this button, it will run this code. It will run this method and it will load the level selection scene. And let's save. Let's run. And now when I click on this button, it loads the other scene. And that's exactly what we wanted to do. So before we continue to the next part, I just want to show you the way we can use the inspector to set different references because you saw that we can actually take this button and place it over here and set this connection. So in the player movement script, right? We used this get component to get references to these components. We use get component animator. We used get component rigid body to get the reference to the rigid body and the animator, right? So if we click on our player, well, we actually need to go back to the level. So if we press on our player, we see that we got these components and we set the reference. But because we set them as public, we can actually see them over here in the inspector. And we can actually set these references the same way we set the button. We can simply take the animator component and drag him into the slot. And then there will be a reference to the animator. And the same way we can do with the rigid body. We can drag it into the rigid body because right now it says none, right? Because it, there is no reference. But if we run the game, 
suddenly there is a reference because we already got the reference at the start method when the game starts. So it does that over here. But we can also just delete this part and drag these components into these slots and it will work the same way. So there's no difference at all. And we can do this with all the other objects. And if we need a reference from a different object, we can also go to that different object and drag the reference and place it over here. Of course, as long as it's a public, because if I'm going to change it to private and I go back here, now it disappeared and we cannot see it anymore. And we can definitely not attach something to it because we can't see it. So if we're going to just use this get component, we don't really need to put them as public, right? We can just set them as private because there is no point of seeing them over here if we're not going to attach the references in the inspector. And that way maybe we're going to get confused and think that there's some reference missing. So if you're not going to attach references inside the inspector, you should just put it on private unless you actually need to use it in a different place and that's why you say that it's public. But you can do it this way, you can get the component and you can drag the actual component into these public references, okay? The difference is that sometimes we want to get the reference on some items that are not yet created and they will only be created in the middle of the game. So we definitely can't attach a component to something that is still not in existence, right? But we can do it using the script. We can say that when this thing will be created, then get the component, okay? And that's the difference. That's why sometimes we do want to use this get component and sometimes we can just drag the actual component into these slots, okay? That's the difference. But you can do it the way you want. So now that we learned that we can actually do it, let's go back into the main menu. And over here, we can already click on this button. The options, we're going to wait with it when we actually have some options to change. And now when we click on this button, it will load the level select. And now we also want to go into level one when we click on this button. So we need to do the same thing, but we don't have to put the script on this button. Over here, we placed it on this button and then we drag the button to get the reference of the script, but we don't have to do it this way every time. We can just create a script on a different object and then drag that object onto the button, right? So for now, we want to create some script, some method that will run this level one. So to do that, we're going to create an empty object and we're going to call it level selection manager, okay? And over here, we're also going to create a script and we're going to call it level selection manager. And now we can drag this script onto the level selection manager and go inside the script. And here we're going to create a method, public void load level one, for example. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing. We need to use Unity Engine Scene Management, the same way we did with the other thing. And Scene Manager, load scene and we're going to say level one right because we want to load this scene level one of course we don't always want to do it this way we don't want to actually specify the scene sometimes we want to create a method that will run anything 
without knowing what will be the actual scene and the scene we can provide later okay so later on we're going to change the way it works right now we just want to run level one so we're going to do it the simple way but later on when we're going to have more levels we don't want to create a method for every level we can do it but it's less efficient so i'm going to show you when we actually get to that but for now load level one and load scene level one and this is the method that we're going to use when we click on the button let's save and now the same way we go to this button we go to on click we add an object with a script so this time we don't have the script on the actual button we have the script on this level selection manager so we can do the same thing we can just drag it over here and find a function which is load level one okay and then we can go back to main menu of course we need to save let's run the game and now we can click on continue it will go here and when we press on play it will load the first level okay and now everything works and of course the last connection that we need is when we finish a level it should load and get us back into the level selection or maybe we want another scene that will show the score right when we actually finish the level we want to see the score of the level like the summary of the level and only then go here so we can create another scene afterwards we can also create many more scenes in between for example if we lost or there's a game over or maybe we also want a scene that will happen before the main menu right for example some kind of splash screen that will show the logo of our company or some kind of animation so there's a lot of scenes we can place in between but this is the way we load these scenes okay so later on well, in the next episode, we're going to deal with the actual information that we want to change. Okay, so we're going to finish our level. We're going to finish level one, for example. And then we need to get all kinds of variables and all kinds of information and store it inside the level selection manager. And over here, we can set all of this information according to the information that we get when we finish level one and of course i'm going to show you how we can do it we're going to save the variables and then we are going to load them and then also when you close the game and you open the game again it will still be saved over here okay so this way even if you play your game and then you close the game and then you come back uh, on the next day you will still see the score and everything will be saved and there is no reason to start it all over again but that's all for this episode i know that it's a kind of a shorter episode but that's just because i don't want to place a lot of subjects together i want to focus on one thing at a time so some episodes will be longer other episodes will be shorter as long as we're actually focusing on one thing and in the next episode we're going to focus on actually changing these variables using the script so i guess it will be a bit longer than this one but that's all for today so thank you for watching i hope you understand the way we actually load scenes and of course this is just when we click on buttons and we load a scene but the same way we can do it in level one for example, when we reach the end, then it will know that we are at the end of the level and then it will load another scene. So we're going to do that inside the script without any buttons. So there's a lot of way we can actually load another scene. But that's all for today. So thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. It will help me a lot. It will also help you to keep track of this series. Leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. 
and I'll see you next time. Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode we dealt with loading different scenes. So for example when we click on this continue button it now loads the level selection scene and when we click on this play button it will load level 1. Okay. In this episode we want to start connecting our menus to the script. So over here in level selection we want to connect all of these UI elements to our code and change them using the code because this text here in the beginning it will be score zero because when we just start the game for the first time we won't have any score. So we're going to change this text and of course these stars we also need to make them fill up after we got a certain amount of points, right? Like it usually happens in these kinds of games. So before we can even start changing the UI, we need to set the last connection, which is when the player actually finishes the level and goes back to this screen. So to do that, let's go to level one. And over here, we're simply going to create some kind of area at the end of this maze. So when the player reaches this area, the level will end. Of course, this is just a very basic way to end the level. And later on, when we're actually going to work on our levels, we're going to add more obstacles and puzzles and things that will make this level a bit harder. So it won't be that easy just to finish the level. But because we want to deal with the menus first, we just want to create this area so the player will finish the level and get some information. So to do that, we're going to create an empty object and we're going to call it level finish, finish, something like that. And we're also going to create a script with the same name, level finish, and we're going to drag the script on this object. Okay. So now let's open the script and let's delete these things. So what we want to do first of all is to set something to happen when the player reaches this part of the map. But how will it know that he actually reach this part is by placing this level finish object over here. So we can't see anything because we don't have any sprite or anything for this object, but it is over here, it exists. So we can see these lines, these axes, and we can move this object over here to the end of this level. And then we're simply going to add a box collider to this object, box collider 2D, okay? And now we can see this little green outline and we learned about box colliders. So it's basically an area that is used for collision, but we can also make it to check if the player actually passes through this area, okay? Or if he enters this area or even if he exits this area, okay? But we want to make this area a little bit bigger so we're going to edit the collider and we're going to change the size of this area by moving these outlines. So now when the player will reach and go inside this area, it means that he entered into this box collider. Okay. But right now he won't be able to enter inside because it's a box collider and our player has a rigid body and a box collider. So he will simply collide with this area the same way he collides with these walls. And we don't want this to happen. We want him to pass or actually enter into this area. So in order to change the way this box collider operates, we simply go here into the component and we check this little box is trigger. So now, when this box is checked, it means that it will no longer be a solid box. And now the player, if he has 
a rigid body and a box collider will be able to pass through this box okay and it will also take notice that we're actually passing through it or we actually entering this area okay because we said that it is trigger and we're going to use this functionality inside the script okay so we go back inside the level finish script that is on this object right so the script the level finish script is on the same object that has this box collider that is trigger so inside the script we're simply going to use a method that is built in inside unity and it works with this box collider and this is trigger functionality and the method is called on trigger enter to D. So it gives us all kinds of things. We also have on trigger exit, but we don't need it. We want on trigger enter. I just press enter and it creates this built in method for us. And over here, we can set something to happen when there is some kind of entrance into the trigger zone and you can see that it uses a collider 2d and basically what it does it checks if something enters into this area okay and the something that enters into this area is this collision so this is a parameter okay and again we still did not learn about parameters and this is not the best way to learn about them but simply think about it as some information that we pass into this method and then we can use this information inside the method. So this information comes from outside, okay? We don't have to set it over here inside this class. This information comes from outside and this Collider 2D is simply something that enters into this area so it's our player okay because our player has a box collider on him so when we enter into this area with the player it will get this box collider and will say okay we got a box collider now we can use this information to do something okay so let's see how it actually works what we want to do we want to say that when the player enters into this area, we're going to finish this level and we're going to load the selection, the level selection again, right? Of course, later on, we're going to change it. We're going to have a screen. We're going to do more things. But for now, we just want to load the level selection when the player reaches this point and enters into this area, okay? So the way we're going to do it is by simply saying that when the player enters this area, run the code that will load the level selection scene, okay? But the thing is that sometimes, for example, we can have different monsters or enemies walking around. And what if this enemy has a box collider and he will by accident enter this area? So the level will finish, although our player did not enter the area, but the enemy entered the area. So we don't want something like that to happen. That's why we need to say that only if the player enters into this area, then do something. So for this, we're going to use the if statement that we learned. And we learned that we can use the if statement to set some kind of condition, right? So we're going to use this if statement and we're going to say that if the collision, so it means that if this box collider or any collider that enters into this area, if it is on the player, so we're going to take this collision and use a thing called compare tag. So with this thing, we can compare the tag of our object and see if it's something specific. So we're going to check if this tag 
is called player. So if this object that enters into this area has a tag that is called player, only then do something, okay? So if something else will enter, it won't run anything. It will only run if the collision has a tag that is called player. So we want to place a tag that is called player on our player. So to do that, we can select our player and over here on the right side, we can see this tag. So there is a lot of different tags. We can also create our own tags if we go to add tag. But usually there is a player tag that is created when we just start the project. So we can use it, okay? So we're going to click on this player tag. And now you can see that the tag is player. And now we tagged this player object with the player tag. And if we click on another object, it will still say untagged. But if we go to the player, it will say that there is a tag and the tag is player. Okay, so now when our player will enter into this area, it will run this method and it will check if the object that entered has uh, some kind of collider. So our player has the box collider. So it will check then if that object has a tag that is called player and our player has a tag that is called player and only then it will run some code. And the code that we want to run is scene manager. Well, we need to again use the namespace scene management, right? So scene manager load scene just like we did in the previous episode and we're going to load level selection okay so now when the player and only when the player enters into this area into the area of level finish it will check that it actually is the player and then it will load the level selection scene okay so let's see how it works Let's just start from the main menu, like we're actually playing the game. Okay, so we press and continue, then we play level one, and now we need to reach the end of this level. And when we reach the end of this level, it should load the level selection screen again. Oh, so it worked. So now it loaded the screen, so it's like we actually finished the level. Of course, we need more things inside the level. We can create some kind of animation. Maybe we want a screen that will summarize the level. But right now it works the way we want it to. So now that we can actually finish our level and go back here, we want to change the score, okay? Of course, Later on, we're going to have more levels, but for now, let's focus on one level. And when we understand how we can do it with one level, we can also do it with the rest of the levels. So we want to change the score of level one. We want it to go over here and we want it to display the score. And also when we exit the game and we come back, we want to still see our score, okay? We don't want to do it all over again when we start the game. We wanted to save the score. And of course, when we finish the level, it will instantly display the score. So to do that, we first need to get the score from level one, right? So we can do that in level finish. So if I go into the script here, we need to get that score. And as I told you later on, we're going to have obstacles, maybe different things we can pick up. It will still be a rather simple game, but the way we are going to give score to our player will be based on time, okay? Again, it depends on the game you want to build. In this game, we're going to create some kind of timer. And 
if the player finished this maze faster, he will get more score. If he takes his time and it will take him a lot of time to finish this maze, then he will get a low amount of score. Okay? So that's the way we're going to deal with score in this game. But I don't want to deal with the timer right now. So all I'm going to do is just give some kind of score to the player and we just want to make this connection to pass the score into the level selection scene. Later on we're going to create the timer and we're going to get some score based on the timer. But we don't want to deal with that right now. So inside the level finish we can simply say that there will be some kind of score, okay? And we can create a variable for it. For example, private int score, okay? Something very simple. And now we can also set the score because as I told you, we're still not going to have any timer and I'm just going to give some kind of score. So I'm going to put it at 100, okay? And now we need to figure out how we can send the score into the next scene, right? Because when we load a different scene, all of these things will be destroyed. We're not going to see level finish, right? When I'm loading another scene, level finish disappears. So we can't use the same score. And that's the way it works in coding. You always need to find ways to reach certain variables if they're outside of your reach, right? So if it's public, for example, if the component is public, then yes, we can do what we did with the player and drag the reference. But this is something else. This is a variable that we need to use in a different scene. And another thing is that when we close the game and open the game again, we are not going to get this score again right? It will get lost. So we also want to save the score if we close the game and open the game. That's why we're going to use player preferences. So player preferences is simply a way we can store information inside the actual folders of our game, okay? So I think most games use this method, although this method is used mostly to save simple things like, for example, the player changed something in the options and we want to save it this way. So we save it using player preferences. For example, the player changed the sensitivity of the game or the resolution or the brightness. So we store all of these things inside player preferences. If we want to save a lot of information for a big game, it's not the best way to use player preferences. But because we only want to save a score and later on we want to save a few more things, we can use player preferences and it will work the same way. So we're going to use player preferences and the reason it's also good is that it is going to be saved even if we're closing the game and opening the game, the data will still be over there because it will simply store our information inside a location somewhere in our project. So even if a person installs our game on a mobile, it will be saved somewhere on his mobile device. And if he plays it on PC, it will be saved somewhere in the registry of the PC. So it's simply a small file that contains all of these information, okay? So the way we're going to save this score, and right now we only got this 100 points, okay? So later on we're going to change it based on the time of completion, but for now we said that it will be 100. So in order to save this score in two player preferences, we need to do it over here because we want to do it before we leave this scene, right? We want to do it before we load level selection, but still when the player actually finished the level, right? When he entered this area. So it will happen over here. And the way we're going to do it is very, very simple, okay? So we simply need to type in player 
preferences. Okay, it says player prefs, but that's the short. And you can see that it's orange now. So it means that it actually found something. It found this class. And we have different options over here. We have get float, get int, get string. We have set int, set string, set float. We have delete all. So there's a lot of different methods inside this class that we can use. And because this score is an int, is an integer, we want to use set int. Okay. It says sets the value of the preference identified by key. So over here, it says that we need to provide a key and we need to provide a value. Okay. Well, this one, the int. So a key and a value. A key is basically the name of this variable and the value is the value of this variable. Okay. And it says string over here because a name usually is a string and we didn't learn about strings yet. If for example, an int stores numbers, full numbers, then a string, we just type in string and we're going to call it my name. So a string simply stores letters, okay? Or full sentences, okay? So we use these quotation marks to make it an actual string. And then we can save this entire word inside this variable that is a string, okay? So if integers store full numbers, floats store numbers with decimal points, strings are simply variables that store names or letters or even sentences, okay? So I can use spaces, I can store a very long string and it will all be stored inside this variable, okay? I can actually store an entire paragraph in this variable. So these are strings. Of course, we're going to use them and we're using them all over because this tag over here, it's also a string. And when we load the scene, we provide a string with this name. So all over the place, we're using strings, although we didn't really learn about them, but now you know what a string is. And of course, we're going to use them more and more. So over here, set int, well, set int, it tells us that we need to provide a string that will be the name, the key, and an integer that will be the value. Okay. So now when we click on this set int, we need to provide first of all, a name for the variable that we want to set and then the actual value. So because we only have one level now, we can store it as and call it level one score. Okay. Later on, when we're going to have more levels, it's not a very good way to do it this way, because then we're going to have to use level two score, level three score, and we want to make it a bit easier for us, but now it will do. So we're going to give this variable a name level one score and then we use this little comma and we need to put a value so the value will be our score but we don't want to just put a hundred over here right because later on our score will change according to the timer so we're not going to actually put the value over here and hard code it but we're going to use the variable itself so we can do it this way and place score over here. And then it will save this variable, this integer that is called level one score and the value will be a hundred. Okay. Or something else. And all of this will be stored inside player preferences. So just to visualize it, it will look something like that inside this player preferences file we're going to just create an int that is called level one score 
and it will be equals 100, okay? Or more precisely, it will be equals to score, okay? So we're simply creating an int somewhere inside player preferences and we're setting it. It means that we're writing it, okay? And then after we did this, we have to save it, okay? Because here we can do all kinds of settings. We can set an int, we can set different things, but after we're done with that, we need to type in player and use the save method. Okay. And now it will save all these things that we changed. Now we have this integer saved inside player preferences and we got the score. So after this is done, we're going to load level selection and in level selection, we can also get this information. Okay. So let's go into level selection and here we can get the information. So we can create some kind of a method. We can create a start. Okay. Start or start method and oh, void, void start. And in the start method, so it means that when this level is actually loading, when the uh, level selection scene is loading, then it will run this code, right? Because the start method runs at the start. So it will run this thing. And then we want to load all of the information that we got. And we're simply going to create some kind of custom method. We're going to call it load saved data or something like that. It's really just a custom method. So you can name it whatever you want and it will run this method. It will call this method. So now let's also create this method over here. Let's also say that it's void. So inside this method, we're going to get the information. Okay. And to get the information, we simply need to go to player preferences and use get int. Okay. And then we simply need to search for the int that we want to get. So because we saved this int and called it level one score, we're going to use the same name to get this int. Okay. Of course, we need to make it a string and we don't need to provide it any value because we don't know what is the value. We want to get the value. Okay. We just say, okay, give me the value of level one score. And it will go into player preferences and it will look for the value that we saved over here. And it will put this value into this line, but we can't just get this integer over here, right? Because we're not doing anything with it. So what we want to do, we want to change this score and place the score over here so it will display score and our score, right? And in our example, it's going to be score 100 and not score 1000. So to change this UI element, we need to get a reference to this text, right? To this UI element. Otherwise, we can't really change it. We need to get the connection. So a simple way to do it is by simply creating a public text and then dragging this UI element into the text reference and then there will be a connection. So right now it's something that we can do and it's the easier way. But later on when we're going to have more levels and maybe we're going to have hundreds of levels, we don't really want to drag these connections for a hundred different levels, right? It will take a lot of time and it's not efficient. We want to make some kind of method that will do it for us. But because we only have one level now, we're going to do it the easy way. So we're going to create inside the level selection manager, right? Because it's in this scene, it's no longer in level one. We're in the level selection scene right now. So we go into the level selection manager into the script and we're going to create a public 
text and this text is simply the UI element, right? But it's some kind of UI element. We don't know which one because we did not create a connection. So we're just creating a public text and we're going to call it level one score. Okay. And just notice that I already added this using unity engine.ui namespace, but in your case, you're not going to have it. So it's not going to recognize this text. Okay. I did some testing, so I already added this unity engine.ui, but in your case, you're not going to see it. So you need to go here and add using unity engine.ui the same way we did with the scene management namespace. Okay. So now that you have the unity engine.ui, it will actually recognize what a text is and it will not cause an error. And now we created this public text that is called level one score. So we're going to save it and we're going to go back over here. And now if we click on level selection manager, we can see over here that we have level one score and it searches for a reference to a text component to a text uh, UI, right? And it says none. So as I showed you in the previous episode, we can do it by using get component, but we can simply drag this thing, the score text element and just drag it into, well, drag it into this slot over here. And now there will be a reference to this score text. Okay. So now basically this score text is this score text. Okay. That's it. That's what we did. We created this connection. So of course, when we're going to have more and more levels, we're not going to do it this way. We're not going to drag a reference for each and every one of them. We can do it. And maybe if it's easier for you, you can also do it, but it's not the best way. It's better to do it with get component and with some kind of loop that will go through all of these levels and just add the references. But I'm going to show you how we can do it when we actually have more levels. For now, this will work. So we created this reference by dragging the actual UI element into this slot. And now we have this connection. Okay. And now we want to change the text inside this UI element, inside this UI element, according to the actual score that we got over here. And it's very simple. All we need to do is take this variable, go over here and use dot text. Okay. So we simply want the text of level one score because this is a text UI element, but we also want to get the text component and change the text over here, right? So to do it inside the code, we need to say dot text and then equals to all of this. Do you understand what I did here? Of course, there's a problem and I'm going to fix it, but you understand what I did here. I went into player preferences and then I used get integer and I search for level one score. And because here we saved level one score and gave it a value, it will be stored inside player preferences. So here I'm just looking for it and I'm getting the value. So now when I'm getting the value, all of this will become the actual value. And as you remember, it goes from right to left. All of this value will go into this. And because we use the text over here, so this value will be what this text is. Okay. But now it gives us an error because it says cannot implicitly convert type int to string. And it's right because 
over here we get an int but here we need to provide a string because a text is a string we can't really put an int over here we need to put a string over here because this text is a string so in order to fix it we can simply say plus and these quotation marks or actually score plus and the value and now there is no error and it will show score the same way it shows here plus the actual value and when we do plus and we're adding score some kind of string to an integer it won't do some crazy addition it will simply add this integer into this string so if this integer is a hundred then score plus a hundred will simply become score 100 okay well no because we didn't put any spaces so it will add the hundred over here so it will be something like that score 100 so we can simply put a little space here between this quotation mark and then it will actually be this way so this way we can add integers and turn them into strings when there's actually some string over here and then we're going to get all of this and all of this will go into text and because this is the text of level one score and level one score is this text that we have a reference to which is this ui element so it will go over here and we're going to see score 100 okay that's the way we're going to do it and of course we can also do it without the score we can simply erase it leave these quotation marks and it will simply say this okay it will simply show 100 but now it will be a string because there's a difference between 100 as a string and 100 as a value as an integer right this is just a text that says 100 and this is a value of 100 which is an integer so there is a difference and because this is a text we need to provide it with a string so if we use these two quotation marks and they're empty it will just show this value without anything added to it but we still need to add this string because we need to convert this int into a string and then place it inside of it okay so if i'm going to delete it it will give me an error because we still need to make this int into a string before we put it over here so i'm just going to say score and small space here and now it should work okay but it won't do it when we first start the game because when we first start the game it will go here and there will be no level one score saved right we're only going to save it when we finish the first level for the first time so we can see how it works right now we didn't save it right there is nothing inside player reference because we did not start the game so if we go to the main menu let's just make sure that everything is saved main menu save and now let's start okay so we press on continue and we can see that the score is zero okay because it simply went over here and because we run this scene so it will run also this script and in the start it will load save data so it will go to load save data and it will search for an integer that is called level one score but because we still don't have this because we didn't play the first level it won't find any score and it will just say score zero and it will set it as score zero 
But then when we go inside the level and we actually reach the end of the level, it should say score 100. Okay, let's see if it works. Score 100. And now, even if I exit the game, okay? So now if I exit the game and I'm going to start the game again, it will still show score 100 because it will go into player preferences and it will still find it because it is still saved over there somewhere on our PC, okay? We can, of course, delete it if we don't want it to exist over there, but there is no reason to do that right now. When a person will install our game on his mobile device or on his PC, then he won't find these player preferences because it is stored locally on our PC. So on their PC, they won't find level one score. It will be empty. So they will have to finish level one and only then it will save something that is called level one score. Okay, so you can see that even when I exited the game and I'm going to go inside and I'm going to click on continue, it will still show score 100. And now even if I restart my PC when I'm going to return to Unity and play this game again, it will still show score 100 because over here, when we load the level selection scene, it goes into player preferences and it finds this thing, okay? And I want you to actually understand where it is saved. So if we go into Unity website, it actually tells us that the player preferences are stored in this location, okay? They're stored inside the registry in this location. So let's see if it's actually saved over there. Let's go over here and type in regid it, regid it. Okay, and now we can open the registry editor. So inside we need to go to this location. So H key current user, then inside we go to software, then inside we go to Unity, then inside Unity Editor, and inside Company Name, and then Project Name, and our project name is 2D Tutorial. So over here we can actually see Level Score 1, Level 1 Score, right? And over here we can see a value, 100. So it's actually a physical location on our PC that is storing all of this information. And right now I only have one thing that is stored here. But later on when we're going to have more levels and we need to store more information, we're going to get more things here. So when a person installs this game on his mobile device, there is also a location on his mobile device that is going to save our player preferences. Okay, so there's also a way to delete all of this information. So for example, you want to test it and you don't want this to be stored over there anymore. So the way we can delete it is by simply going somewhere, let's say in the continue button, because the continue button is located in our main menu, right? Over here. So this is the first script that will run when we start the game. So over here, before we go to level selection, we can simply say player prefs dot delete all. Okay. So it says removes all keys and values from the preferences used with caution. So you really need to use it with caution. If you do this, if you delete all, it will delete all of the information that you stored inside player pref. Okay, so we don't really care because we're just testing the game. We don't care if we want to lose the score. You can also use this thing in the options section, right? For example, you want to create an option for the player to reset all of his progress. 
right? So if you want to reset all of his progress, he can go to options, click on a button, and it will run this thing here, and then it will delete all the information. So let's see how it works. We did this here, right? Let's save. Let's run the game. And now it basically should delete all of these things. So we go into the registry and of course let's reload. Okay. Now it was deleted. These things here are not the player references, but the level one score, now it's gone. Okay. So this way we can delete all of our player preferences. And there's also a different thing we can use, which is delete key. So here we're simply providing the name of the key and then it will delete the entire value from the player preferences. So if we just want to delete the level one score, we can simply say delete key and we say only delete this thing here. Don't delete all the rest. Okay. So there's also many uses for this thing. But remember, when we're saving something into player preferences, for example, we're saving a score on level one score, we don't need to delete it every time we want to put another score. If we're going to do this and we're going to save a new score on top of level one score, it will simply override it and maybe the next time it will be 400. So you don't need to delete this one and save another and save the new value. It will simply go over here and it will replace the old score with the new score. Okay. So you don't need to delete it every time. You don't really need to delete it at all. You just need to leave it this way and then the score will get updated according to the score and the score we're going to change using the timer or maybe in your game when the player picks up coins or things like that. Okay. So that's the way we're doing it. And if we go over here and we go into our game, we can see score zero because we deleted everything from the player preferences. Okay. There is nothing here. So it says score zero. And this is the way we're going to transfer this information. And now, even if we close the game, restart the game, it will always be saved. Another thing that we need to do is actually change these stars. So we want to change them into these ones, into these orange ones, when we have a certain amount of points. So we can say that if the player gets a thousand points, he will get three stars. If he gets 500 score, he will get two stars. And if he gets more than a hundred, he will get only one star, right? So we're going to do all of that in the next episode because it will be a bit longer. We need to actually get references for all of these. Where was it? For all of these stars. And we're not going to do it the same way. We're not going to just drag them into references because again, if we're going to have a hundred levels, we don't want to go and drag these stars for each level. We want to create some kind of method that will just do it for us. Okay. And in the next episode, we're also going to create another level. So we're simply going to take this one, duplicate it and create the second level. And this level, the second one will be locked. So we also need to say only if you finished the first level, then open the second level. Or we can say only when you got one star at level one, then you can play level two. So we can do whatever we want, but all of that will happen in the next episode. In this episode, I just want to show you how we can actually use player preferences to save information and to transfer this information from one scene to another because the information that we get in level one is not going with us to the level selection unless we actually save it somewhere okay 
So that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. It will help me a lot. Please leave a like. It will also help me a lot. And see you next time.